All right, it's 616. Are we, we have Shelly, Paula, not on camera yet. Hi, Tony. Mr. Wilman looking very dapper tonight. All right. Uh, Ryan, can you take a roll? Sure can. Councillor Wilman. Here. Councillor Wusso. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Cow. Here. Mayor Godis. Here. Councillor Step. Yes. Councillor Hershey. Present. Quorum. All right. Uh, please join I'm here as well. Oh, sorry about that, <laughs> Councillor Davis. All I right. Had it. Is everybody join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. Uh, next on the agenda is agenda changes and conflicts. Does anybody have a change or a conflict of interest? Councilor Wilman. Yeah, I'd ask that item 10B be moved off of the consent agenda. I've got a conflict in that item. I'd like to build a vote on the other items. Okay. Can I have some clarity what item that is? Consent agenda is 10. What letter? It's going to be 10B, the local jurisdiction letter. Okay, thank you. 10B. Okay. Any other changes or conflicts of interest? Okay. Seeing none, we will go to citizens appearing before council for not items not appearing on the agenda. So to be clear, if this is about Blake Street or anything to do with the airport design, uh, please save your comments until that time. That one? Okay. Uh, I will bring it back for council comments. Councilor Hershey. Thank you. I'll, I'll just be brief. Um, uh, last Friday, I was able to get my um, second vaccination at Valley View Hospital, and I know that the mayor got a tour of that facility, but I just wanted to compliment the staff and a lot of the people working there who are volunteers on what it, and the valets and the doctors and the nurses and the people giving the injections, including um, people who work at the pharmacy there and, and everyone else who um, did such a great job moving people in and out of there it was like a little military machine it worked really well and um, they're all to be applauded this is such an important thing that we're having done and i encourage everyone if you can get a vaccine get a vaccine secondly um monday night um jeff cheney my boss lou valerio and chief dara spoke at a zoom meeting i know some of you got to see it but it was excellent they really explained you know you know, sometimes for non-attorneys or people not familiar with the criminal justice system, how it works, how people go, who goes to jail, who gets arrested. They spoke for almost two hours, two and a half hours, Deborah will correct me, and uh, answered a lot, a lot of questions and were really great. And they talked about the downtown. And, and one of the things that came up is the security guards that were there this weekend, because I think there were some concerns there might be an issue. And I was down there this weekend. And I think Mr. Um, Mr. Davis would agree that I think we should continue that or even have a, a large presence. It really makes a big difference to the businesses down there and to the people who come to visit. And uh, I appreciate everyone. So thank you. Thanks, Tony. Uh, Charlie. Yeah, just briefly, I add to Tony, I, because of my age, I've had both my shots and Valley View Hospital people were, the first time I went in, it was very crowded and you're in a line and they're very congenial and, and supporting of, of the people. <clears throat> excuse me, coming through the system. And I think you're doing a phenomenal job. And I suspect that the hospital and rifle is doing the same. So I really appreciate that. The other, the other issue I want to bring up is I talked a little bit about it last week is the Colorado Municipal League uh, and is mentioned in, in their legislative summary that I sent out to all of you that there may be this uh, funding available for uh, uh, Main Street projects as part of the legislative agenda this year. And the reason I want to bring it up is that since the last meeting, I on occasion have a conversation with uh, Mr. Beckley with the uh, uh, Glenwood um, Caverns and the uh, Mountain Hot Springs, so you have that right. Um, and 
I had talked to him about something that we had discussed a couple of years ago, and that was the concept of having a local circulator, which would bring people from the motels in West Glenwood and that area into the downtown area. Um, and he also mentioned the uh, new uh, mountain, mountaineering uh, railroad that may be coming in. And I think I hear it's coming in in August uh, for regular trips. <clears throat> so I, I re-raised with him the concept of having a, a local circulator tourism kind of trolley. And, and uh, there's an interest in that by himself. And he believes with other hotel owners uh, and motel owners in that area. I had uh, uh, referred him to the Transportation Commission and, and uh, suggested that he talk to them about it and realized uh, uh, that I may have done that without council permission. So I want to make sure council is aware I made that referral to the Transportation Commission. It seems to be a good place for that conversation to start in <clears throat> conjunction with the transit demand uh, study that we, not transit demand, the the uh, transfer demand study and, and the, the Rye Glenwood system, uh, which will be looked at over the next uh, few months by transportation and other entities. So I just want to be council where I made that referral. I apologize for doing it without getting council approval first. So that's all I have. Thanks, Charlie. Ingrid? I think Paula was actually ahead of me. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Paula. Uh, just uh, real quickly, I just wanted everybody to know that um, um, congratulations. Uh, I think Charlie also has both his shots and Tony does now. And I think that's huge. And I hope everybody in the community is thinking that way. So we can um, get back on economic track too. Um, I wanted you to know that um, we had a detox um, funding meeting uh, for the first time in many months this week with uh, some of the key players who have been looking, we're looking at the detox center starting two years ago. Um, and I just wanted you to know that we're still looking at that, trying to see the opportunity. There's something uh, space still available at the new Mind Springs building. Um, there are some new options in place like a mobile unit. Um, and it's just been a while. So I didn't want you guys thinking that had died on the vine and that will be coming back. It is resurrecting and we're looking at what opportunities there are to help this um, community moving forward, knowing that this also overlaps with, you know, the problems we've been having downtown and what kind of mental health um, opportunities available and those kind of things. The other thing I wanted to bring up and, and just maybe some clarification as well is what, what are we gonna allow this summer as far as the dining opportunities that we put out last summer? Um, somebody mentioned in an earlier meeting today that you know that's really kind of changed the um, environment downtown and it could be a very positive thing moving forward, allowing those opportunities. So that should be a council discussion, I think this spring on um, keeping those opportunities out there um, where they work well. Thanks, Paula. Now, Ingrid. Okay, perfect. Thank you. I just, this last week, we've received a significant amount of community feedback on a couple agenda items for this evening. And I just wanted to commend our community for reaching out and for finding this venue to connect with us and to share their voice and their, their preferences for the shape and the future of our community. And also commend all of the counselors um, who were receptive and, and I know took many phone calls on different subjects that we're going to be talking about this evening. And I think that that open communication is so important and I commend you all, both community members and counselors. So thank you guys. I think that's the way that we get the best community possible. So thank you. Deborah. I was just gonna say, Paula, I believe the leases go through September for the expanded outdoor dining. So yes, we should definitely have that conversation with council, probably, but that's next fall and summer. I do believe there it's very popular and we've heard very good things. Great, that's good to hear. I just um, didn't know when was expiring what at what time and it's, it's nice to see that we can keep that out there for our tourist community and restaurants. Any other council comments? Uh, you know, I have one. I just want to, 
I guess make a correction to the record. I think it's important when there's misinformation out in the public that that it needs to be corrected, and it it has to do with the airport, um, but it's not specific about um, the, tonight's agenda item. Um, there is a an op-ed in the paper that came out this week, and uh, by, uh, Mr. Gary Vick, and I, I think it was it was short of fact and long on on assumptions, fantasies, and, and sometimes just outright falsehoods. Um, in it, he alluded to a $17 million benefit to the city that why would we trade $6 million for a tunnel for $17 million of, of uh, revenue a year? And our, our entire sales tax budget, by the way, the, the amount we receive is $18 million. So um, that's not correct. We don't get $17 out of $18 million from that airport loan. I just want to set the record straight on that. Um, another um, falsehood was that uh, myself, Councillor Kalp, Davis, and Step um, are incredibly eager to shut down that airport to erect condos. Uh, there has never been a conversation, publicly or not, about our desire to shut down the airport to build condos. Um, that is an exaggeration at best and a lie at, at worst. Um, he also made an assertion in there that this council has never consulted with or taken a recommendation, uh, has taken recommendations from the airport commission about um, this alignment. That is also false. Um, I am on the airport commission as this board's liaison. I have missed one meeting in the last two years. I bring back to this council all the goings on about that. I bring all the council going ons back to the airport commission. We met three months ago with the airport commission in a joint work session. Um, our staff for the last three months has directly worked with the airport commission and has sat out there uh, bringing consultants in and working directly hand in hand with them. Three weeks ago at the last airport commission, we specifically asked the airport commission to give us a recommendation and they demurred because they didn't have enough information at that time. So that was false. And I want to say I'm, I'm kind of disappointed um, with the Post Independent for allowing that misinformation and falsehoods to go out into the community. I know that they are a paper and it is not bad. It wasn't their staff, it wasn't um, their reporting. But when you allow yourself to be a venue without a cursory, hey, this seems weird that 17 out of $18 million of your revenue comes from the airport, that doesn't seem right. I think they have a higher duty. Um, I also wanna compliment the Post Independent as well. And the reason um, I think I'm able to criticize in this venue um, a bit on this is because they have been so good. They almost always get it right. I've lived in this community for 15 years. I've seen five publishers, four editors, and dozens of reporters. Uh, John Stroud's always there. <laughs> so, uh, you know, he's, he's the, 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 the ship steerer. So, uh, you know, and they always do a really, really good job. And so that's why I was, I think, disappointed that they allowed this opinion piece. And I guess I would call on the Post Independent, not to censor, not to censor anybody or shut anybody down. I don't want that but to maybe have more discernment. I think as we need to be more discerning in our social media and online lives, um, I think that that duty carries through to uh, really our, our, our wonderful paper. I really do appreciate Peter and Bryce who lead that. I appreciate all the reporting that's been done on our time in council. So that's probably why this comes up for me as something that um, I think the community needs to know um, that not everything you read in an op-ed is correct and sometimes it's just outright false. That's my statement. Um, any other council comments? Okay, way to follow that up. Gosh, no soft landing, huh? <laughs> All right, uh, next on the agenda is, let me get to back to my agenda. Consent agenda, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councilor Hershey. Mr. Mayor, uh, I would make a motion to approve the consent agenda with the exception of item B. I'll second the motion. Thank you, Councilor Cal. Uh, any opposed? Hearing none, motion passes unanimously. All right, uh, next item on the agenda is item number 11. Wait, Mr. Mayor, don't we have to do item B now? Mr. Wilman, correct? Yes, thank you very much, Councilor Hershey. So item B. Keep you on I'm, going to recuse, I'm going to recuse myself. Well, I would make an, a secondary motion to approve item 10b which is the local jurisdictional letter unless mr hanlon has any objections which he does not i would make that motion and i'll go ahead thank you both <laughs> i'll give uh that to tony and second to ingrid uh any opposed signify by saying 
nay. All right, by lack of uh, nays, the motion carries unanimously. All right, Charlie, can you rejoin us? There you are, all right. Okay, next item, I'm very, very proud to, uh, to read this proclamation for uh, Mr. Matt Nunez. Matt submitted, uh, I don't know, is there a way to promote him so that we can, I really would like to see him be embarrassed and have to take his lumps as we read this. Well, if somebody can promote him, because I can't, my screen's not working with my fat fingers apparently. Oh, there you are, Matt. Okay, so really quick before I read the proclamation, I, I, I believe, I wanna make sure that this is correct. Uh, there you are. That Mr. Nunez was, uh, he submitted photographs for the new license, the, the driver's license for the state of Colorado. And uh, his was selected as, as the picture. And I think, I think, uh, again, help me out, but I believe he submitted two of, uh, pictures and, and two of the four finalists were actually his pictures and they're just fantastic. So Matt, can you, well, I don't need, we don't need the whole story, but I'd love to just hear a little bit about, you know, where you got these pictures and if you could talk a little bit about, you know, how, how this came to be. Yes, thank you, Mayor Godas and members of council. Um, uh, I was expecting some embarrassment tonight, so but I'm very grateful. Um, I, I submitted three photos, and uh, my three photos were the three finalists um, for the front of the new driver's license design in the state. Submitted them over the summer, um, received word that those three photos were finalist at the end of January, and then um, my image of Mount Sneffels outside of Ridgeway was selected um, as the winner. So I had the honor of speaking to Governor Polis um, earlier this week, and um, of course, just sharing a little bit about uh, my images and um, why I love these uh, locations where I get to take them. I, and I was quoted in the Denver Post as saying, it's not hanging lake. That's my one regret in this uh, contest, but I'm proud to represent rural Colorado in this way. Matt, well, Matt, do you have the photo? Can you share it with us? Oh yes, I can. I can pull it up. <laughs> and thank you, Matt, for also while you're speaking with Governor Polis to petition him for funds to help with our watershed restoration and our Southbridge funding. I know you did. It, so I want to thank you for that. Yeah, I'm not sure what the other, uh, what the winner of the backside of the license had to plug for the governor, but <laughs> let's see here. Matt, while you're bringing that up, I'm going to read this proclamation because the embarrassment's not quite over until somebody has to stand awkwardly and get a proclamation from me. Um, whereas Matt Nunez is a fifth generation Coloradoan with deep generational roots, having served our state and country in both the military and government. And whereas Matt graduated from St. Edwards University and currently resides in Glenwood Springs, where he is an economic development specialist for the city of Glenwood Springs and an amateur photographer and, well, amateur? I don't know. I'm going to give you a little more props than that. Whereas Matt designed the new background for the Colorado driver's license and whereas Matt's design was chosen out of 280 entries from 119 entrants with over 55,000 Coloradoans voting. And whereas Matt is quoted as saying the final product was a labor of love as it took months to develop the photo. And whereas his landscape will garnish the driver's license of Coloradoans everywhere. And they will have a glimpse into how lucky the city of Glenwood Springs is to have Matt Nunez as a member of our economic and community development. Therefore, be it resolved that I, Jonathan Godis, mayor of Glenwood Springs in the state of Colorado, ask all our city residents to join me in proclaiming, honoring, and celebrating Matt for his profound accomplishment. In witness thereof, I hereby who, hereby unto, set my hand and cause the seal of city of Glenwood Springs, Colorado to be affixed this fourth day of March in the year 2021. Thank you, Mr. Nunez. We're really, really proud. Well, thank you so much. This is a wonderful place to live and a wonderful uh, uh, staff to work with. And, um, uh, you know, this place is not just great because of the landscape photo opportunities. It's because of all the great people. So thank you very much. Thank you, Matt.
All right. Um, next. Uh, item number 12, Blake, State, Blake Street configuration. Who is presenting on this? Oh. Mr. Blake, maybe? <laughs> Hold on, let me. Not around it. Are we doing a full presentation? Or? Jonathan, um, if you could promote Jessica as well, um, she'll give her presentation again. Yeah, who's Jessica? I'm here. <laughs> Mr. Mayor, are we, Ms. Wusso asked if we're giving a full presentation. I thought we had this. Is this just an abbreviated presentation so we can move this along, please? Yeah, we had a full presentation in our work session, but we haven't had a public one in a public meeting. So um, I think we can go as fast as we have questions for. I will do my best. <laughs> All right, can everybody see that? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Um, so we're discussing the Blake Street configurations. We presented it to the public. We've had a neighborhood meeting. We presented it to Transportation Commission, had quite an in-depth discussion with them, and then also to the council in a work session. And so I will quickly go over all of this information, which was in the previous presentation. So alternative A is replacing Blake Street or Blake Avenue as is, um, maintaining a minimum of 20 feet for fire and emergency services access. And this is gonna be the least impactful to the neighbors and it's not gonna change anything but the roadway surface. Um, along with that comes 26th Street improvements that we have to do anyway. There's some drainage out there that needs to be repaired um, that Matt and the streets department has on their agenda for this year, um, as well as making some small actual roadway improvements, hopefully um, budget pending. So the benefits of replacing in kind is that this is the lowest cost. Um, it doesn't fix any of the traffic calming, it doesn't fix any drainage issues, um, but it is facilitated within the right of way and it's minimal materials. Um, it maintains two way traffic and has low impacts to the neighbors. But the drawbacks are that we aren't fixing anything besides the roadway itself. So Alternative B is a one-way configuration. And this one-way configuration has been proposed in a couple of different iterations. The first one being um, from 23rd to 26th, the second one from 26th to 27th. And then there was a final option that staff had developed that would be from the new Palmer connection through the, the to the Walmart um, to the south. So, with the one way from 23rd to 26th, north, northbound traffic would be forced to Palmer Avenue at 26th Street, which does have an impact to those neighbors. Um, one way from 26th to 27th would force all northbound traffic that made it to the 27th Street intersection to try to get back onto Highway 82, um, thus potentially lowering the level of service at that intersection, impacting RAFTA pretty significantly and their ability to get in and out of their facility. Um, that road at 27th between Highway 82 and Blake Avenue is less than 190 feet. And the signal timing there does not allow a lot of cars to get through that intersection very quickly. Um, additionally, CDOT may require us to acquire Carpet One and make improvements at that intersection. If we did a southbound through the old Blake location, the Blake Gate location between the new Palmer that's going in with Bell Rippey and the Walmart entrance, um, we would propose that we do a 10 foot road section so that two way traffic wouldn't be facilitated through there. Um, and it would be a physical barrier for people to go through. Um, EMS doesn't currently access through that gate, so it's not gonna affect their um, response time. 
So these are the different options and <laughs> more of a visual form that hopefully makes more sense to everybody. So the benefits, um, this does lower the volumes on Blake Avenue uh, for southbound only. It is a lower cost option. The, the roadway could be facilitated in the right of way. It does have minimal materials. We could put in some pedestrian facilities, but that would have an added cost. And we could always change it in the future if it, if it didn't work well. Um, there are no lower impacts to neighbors. Drawbacks, currently I don't have drainage considered. Bicycle traffic would oppose vehicular traffic. Um, there are ways around that we could put in a median or some sort of barrier to facilitate that two-way, similar to what we have on the south side of 6th Street between the tunnel and um, the Grand Avenue pedestrian bridge. It does lower city circulation. There are less options for people headed northbound. They are forced to Grand Avenue. Um, so in a, an emergency situation, Grand Avenue were closed. It would be more difficult for people to make it through town. But it's always difficult for people to make it through town in emergency situations. Um, it would potentially increase Palmer traffic during times of congestion. And it increases backups within the neighborhood. And it would likely limit raft access depending on what one-way configuration was selected. The other thing to note here is 29th Street is slated for a three-quarter movement um, that disallows southbound access to 82. Right now, it's uncontrolled, so it, all movements are allowed. Um, I imagine if we have a one-way northbound, we might have more people going to 29th. Um, which would, would be a lower risk because they are going northbound, so they'd be making a right turn, but CDOT may request we make those improvements at some point. So the public feedback on the one-way configuration was that everyone really liked the idea that it would reduce the traffic um, headed home in the evening, um, but then it would could or would potentially back up on Palmer. Um, I'll let you guys, I know you've seen this already. So then alternative C was the advisory bike lane, which is a little more of a unique proposal. Um, I think Blake and its current volumes do meet the FHWA guidance for this. When I spoke to Ottawa, the Ottawa engineer who instituted their pilot program, he thought it was a good idea. Um, and that it was pretty successful with, with their system. So the advisory bike lanes, we can do a few different configurations. Um, I know that during the work session, there was a comment about how to, um, how to, um, delineate that a little bit. And I do have just an image that shows different pavement colors that can be used. You can do it with striping as well. The pavement coloring is a little less maintenance though. So I just wanted to pull that up for you guys. And then So I did this layout, it has five foot bike lanes, bike pedestrian lanes, so it's shared um, on either side and a 12 foot shared drive lane. The bike lanes would be striped or colored asphalt, um, which delineates those, but the shared drive lane would not be striped. So the natural reaction to people on a roadway that's not really striped is to stay in the middle. Um, my neighborhood is not striped at all and everybody drives down the middle of the road <laughs> unless they see a car coming at them. Um, the nice part about this configuration is that every user is considered equal. So bikes, um, pets, and cars are all equal users, and whoever's there first gets priority. Um, so there's a little bit of a learning curve, but according to the engineer from Ottawa, it wasn't as hard as they thought it would be. And there's similar improvements on 26th Street with that configuration. And then when we get to the new um, Bell Rippey entrance, there's some traffic coming there. I think their plans have changed slightly from this um, since they've resubmitted. 
and then a little bit of a visual of what that could look like. And then Palmer would be striped similarly. There could be an overlay. There are a lot of different options we could go with here. Um, we don't necessarily have to do the same thing on Palmer that we do on Blake. It's more of a, a preference. And then 26 Street again is pretty similar. I did put a mini roundabout in this configuration at 26. Um, and again, I just threw in some traffic calming ideas just to see what it would look like, but those are not set in stone at all. So the benefits are that everyone's an equal user. It is a lower cost. It can be facilitated in the right of way. It maintains two-way traffic on all of our streets. Um, it does facilitate that missing bike connection. This is a, our designated bike route in our long range transportation plan. Um, but it's also easily changed uh, to a one-way or a, just a two-way traffic without um, bike lanes as well. I don't have drainage considered. And then it doesn't provide pedestrians with separated projected space, which is what a lot of people are looking for. And it could lead to congestion during peak hours. That's always, that's always an issue. And that was our biggest concern with, with this option that there would be significant backup from the Highway 82 traffic. Um, they think that the traffic volumes are too high, but a lot of people didn't have any concerns. So it seemed like there were, you know, a lot of positive feedback for this, but uh, there was a lot of people that did have concerns about the vulnerable users being exposed and people not understanding how it worked. And then my last option, which I thought everyone would like the most, was the least liked. <laughs> so I did a two-way option with a raised path, which did have a vertical separation, but the vertical separation was asphalt and it was only three inches. And there was concern from the bike users that it would lead people to tripping or falling. I think there are ways around that. You can use colored asphalt, you can do striping. There, there are options there, but um, the, the neighborhood did not seem to like this at all. I think they would have preferred a sidewalk. And I did the similar traffic calming options through this corridor as I did with the, the advisory bike lane. Kind of what it would look like. And then we could do the same thing on, on Palmer. We could take the existing asphalt and mill and do an overlay that raised it up if we wanted to. So the benefits of this would be a physical vertical separation from traffic. Um, it's mountable, so cyclists could choose to be a roadway user or path user. It would be lower cost um, and facilitated within the right of way. It does maintain two-way traffic. It facilitates our bikes. However, the separation is mountable, which could lead to some confusion. Cars might try to park on it. Um, it could uh, be hard to see in the snow and harder to convert if not successful. We would need to do a mill and overlay to reduce that raised um, path. So the biggest concern with this one is the two-way traffic and people cutting through during peak hours. Um, and a lot of people did not like this approach. It was not a favorite <laughs> approach. So the conclusion that we got from the neighborhood is that they would prefer a one-way southbound from 26 to 27. Transportation Commission has recommended a one-way southbound from 26 to 27 on a temporary or trial time of six months. I added that six months clarification because uh, Steve Smith did point it out to me that they did propose it as temporary. However, staff doesn't support this configuration. Um, in a one way at, from 26 to 27th, the northbound evening traffic would be pushed to 27th. It would back up pretty quickly or cause people to do U-turns in the intersection. Uh, they might try to take some riskier moves out of 29th. Um, and without accurate counts in this area with it being open, it's really hard for us to actually gauge how much traffic would be going through there. So that northbound traffic could ignore the signage. If we don't have a sufficient enough barrier for them, they might just try to go northbound anyway and ignore 
any signage or barricades. And I think RAFTA will take a lot of issues with the, the traffic backing up there at the 27th signal. The option that staff has recommended is if a one-way is considered is to do it that 10 foot section of asphalt between the Walmart entrance and New Palmer. This would probably be the, it would facilitate better movements for traffic through the neighborhood of Palmer and Blake while still giving them that protection from that northbound uh, peak traffic during high congestion times and protect that neighborhood's living as well as allowing the raft of buses getting in and out and keeping that intersection functioning well. But city staff as a whole supports maintaining the roadway and the two-way traffic functions just for the fact that they are public streets and this does allow alternate routes throughout our community. And when we only have one route in and out, it makes it really difficult to evacuate people. So, questions, concerns? Oh. Jessica, the staff recommended way, I'm still having a hard time visualizing that. You still get all of the traffic coming off the highway at 27th Street going down Blake Avenue, right? So, the, and I guess, Terry could correct me if I'm wrong, but the biggest complaint we actually get is that people are coming off at the Blake Avenue and I say at Highway 80 and 82 entrance at the Roaring Fort Marketplace because it's an easy ride off of 82 and are taking it, would take it all the way down. Now people, yeah, get off at 27th currently because the gate's closed. But if we, if we did a one way from 26th to 27th, it'd be likely that most of those people that are doing that movement would go down 24th or 23rd and still take Blake if they're really that determined. Well, they're already taking 27th and you, then you add 100 units of a new condominium and those people are coming off. So that alternative isn't going to lessen any traffic that's coming. You're still gonna see the same increase in traffic that is projected people using 27th as an exit and then the new subdivision, correct? It would stay, it would stay about the same, I guess, is, if that's the concern. It, people that, would that's get what off I was trying 27th. to figure out. Yeah, it would stay about the same. The concern with opening the gate is that the entrance at Blake in 82 is a lot easier for people to make that movement and they'll be more likely to make that movement. Yeah. Paul, I would just add that the, um, you know, it, it keeps um, people from the Walmart, um, you know, commercial development from, from making that move. It um, wouldn't prevent, you know, what occurs today, um, any cut through traffic off of 27th, and it wouldn't prevent, you know, any new traffic from the, um, the proposed subdivision from continuing north. It, it, um, it would simulate what we have today, which is the gate. Um, it would prevent that northbound movement through the gate, um, but allow the southbound movement so um, it does have some effect, but it may not be, um, you know, exactly what the neighborhood is hoping to prevent. Right. Thank you. And um, I know I've asked this in the past, um, the, the putting in actual sidewalks, have we ever got a projection on that cost? Is it like a million dollars? Is that correct? On Blake would Street, be, sorry. It, I'm, it's unsure, because we would need to acquire right of way in order to facilitate sidewalks. And Paul, are you um, asking about Palmer as well, or just um, Blake? The um... Blake, if we're looking at it for a two-way, I just, like I've stated in the past, I'm concerned that that street is not, um, it's not set up right now for two-way traffic. So I'm just worried about the cost. And I know that we haven't seen that proposal. And I, think um, I know that's not in our budget. So I, I'd just like to get a cost on what it would take to put sidewalks on that street if we make it two-way. Okay. I'm not sure how long that segment is, but I think for our fee and lieu calculation, I gave for Gretchen was like 140 a linear foot. 
but that doesn't include right of way and subgrade prep because there is no sidewalk out there. Right. Oh, I know. I've driven and walked on that street. <laughs> I've looked at it a lot. <laughs> and, um, and I don't Paula, know what 140 linear uh, per foot is. I don't know how many feet that street is. So yeah. somebody would have to give me that number too. <laughs> And I, yeah, I think we would probably need to spend a little bit of time with it because, um, you know, I, Ryan did do a layout of, um, of sidewalk through there. And I do think that, you know, at least we showed the line work that could fit within the right of way we had. Right. But, um, you know, that said, a lot of our right of way become is really close to some of those existing buildings. And I think there would probably be some um, discomfort um, from the residents there when, you know, they um, once they realized how close that right of way really is to their to their um, homes. And the other thing that we didn't consider is any you know drainage. Whenever we put in a raised sidewalk, we have to adjust for um, the water. You know, now can't you know do the 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 uh, I guess the move in the way that it does today. So <laughs> we would want to you know look at the grading and the drainage. So it's it takes a, just a little. It would take a little bit more work for us to figure out a full cost for you. Yeah, and I think we lose quite a few driveways too. Right, I'm just well, concerned about people and kids and walkers and bikers. That's why I was asking. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, we can give you get you a number, but we'll need a little bit of time. Thanks. Nope, we're still muted. Who was that? There you go. Was that me? It is. Yeah, sorry. Shall okay, I? I didn't hear what you said. Um, I just, I had a quick question either for Jessica or Terry is, what is the plan on Blake Avenue between 23rd and 27th or 26th primarily? It's in such bad shape. Is, if, if we were to go with a one-way configuration temporarily, would there be work done on that roadway and or, or what's the schedule on that? Yeah, so Matt has a budget set aside that includes Blake Avenue improvements, 26th Street and another street I can't remember. So depending on what option is selected to move forward by council and what those budgetary limitations are, there's some improvements that have to take place such as that storm work on 26th Street this year um it will just depend but i think we were waiting to make that determination until we got better direction okay yeah. i'm just wondering if, you know maybe we could get cost numbers on what it would cost to if we do improvements on blake avenue to include some of those like the alternative bike lanes or things just as an overall improvement to the roadway whether it's one way or two way in the future so that we have options available. And Shelly, just to add on to what Jessica said, you know, I do believe Matt has money in the budget right now for asphalt replacement, um, as well as, um, like Jessica said, drainage in 26th Street and some electrical work in Blake. So adding, um, you know, any of the features that Jessica has designed would be an add on to what's currently budgeted in 2021. Okay, but that is... Any that Sorry, is yeah, any of that traffic calming would be extra. And I think we also still have to help pay for um, the improvements at the Palmer. There's some cost sharing there. Right. With okay. All of these. okay. Yeah, just, just to be clear, we have, it's a small budget. And basically the budget's called out from, we're going to work on Blake somewhere between 23rd and 82. You know, there's a lot of concrete pads we'd like to put in for them, some of the bus stops that are destroyed. Um, there's two sections of storm sewer we really need to fix because neither one of them actually go anywhere. Um, that we do have traffic calming money that engineer has engineering has like fifty thousand every year for that program. If they want to do some traffic calming with that, maybe this is a good location. But you know, I think the money amount that we have is probably enough. If we had city crews tear out Blake Avenue and redo the subgrade, that we could probably get it paved um, along with all those other pieces and parts. So it's it's a pretty small amount of money. We can go places with it, but we kind of have to make decisions on where to go. It, it won't do curb and gutter. It won't do sidewalk. Those are very expensive items. Um, regrading and reprepping for sub base is easy. Um, asphalt is fairly inexpensive, but hardscapes become very, very expensive very quickly. So 
you know, it's maybe a work in progress for Blake Avenue. Maybe it's 27th street to pass the gate. We help with Bell Rippy or something and we do 26th street improvements. Um, but it, like I said, it's, it's kind of a small budget for this year. It's a tight year. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Matt. Yeah. Um, and I did, sorry, I did pull that, that measurement of the length, just the length of feet. So for one side of sidewalk with that $140 linear foot amount would be about $220,000. And that doesn't include any drainage improvements. It doesn't include any extra subgrade prep since there is none out there right away, anything like that. That's just the concrete. Thank any, you. Any other questions? Uh, I, I have one. So Jessica or Terry, you said this is uh, in the uh, long range bike transportation plan. This is a designated bike route. Um, if it were to become one way, how do people on bikes or pedestrians or the kids, how do they navigate that going north? You know, it's a little, it is a problem. Um, you know, Jessica's taken a look at it. I think we would want to um, raise and separate the path. Is that what the conclusion you came to, Jessica? Yeah, we, there's a couple of ways to do it. In downtown Denver, and I think in Boulder, there's a lot of one-way streets where they have like a wider 10-foot uh, route path. Um, it's either striped or they do candlesticks. What we did on uh, 6th Street, on the south side of 6th Street between the tunnel and that goes over to Two Rivers Park and um, the bridge is lane, I think it's eight foot. So you could facilitate two-way bike traffic. But yeah, it doesn't, technically it's a bike lane. It's not a sidewalk or for pedestrians. We could certainly stripe it um, for pedestrians or multimodal. We could put in candlesticks we could raise it. There are a few different options, but anytime you change the grade, it's going to affect the drainage. Yeah. And Jessica is correct. I mean, a good example is some of the um, bike lanes that cross on, um, if, you, if you're familiar with um, Boulder and Pearl Street Mall, they have a series of one-way uh, one streets that cross the mall, and um, all of them, most of them have um, bike lanes that are associated with them. And there is a separation, you know, um, either with, you know, their street trees and medians or um, at a very minimum candlesticks. So out of these options, what is the most, I guess, if you had to rate them, what is the most pedestrian bike friendly and what's the least pedestrian bike friendly? Terry, you want to weigh in first? <laughs> 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 I know what I would do. Jump in on that one. <laughs> Jessica's like, "Hey, boss." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, I um, that idea of the of the um, the shared lane, um, you know, um, Linda actually originally proposed that to us um, as something that um, you know is commonly done in places like Amsterdam, and you know. It, I don't know how much, um, how, how often it's been installed in the United States, but um, it really looks like it would slow traffic down um, because you're essentially creating a head-to-head -head traffic condition. Um, and, um, you know, it creates these really wide lanes on the, um, on the sides for pedestrians. And I know, um, you know, there were some concerns from, um, you know, the biking community about um, there not being any sort of vertical separation between the um, you know, the bikers and, the, um, and the, the single lane and that, you know, essentially to pass anybody on the, on the road, you have to move off at least, you know, to allow those cars to pass. But, you know, from a, um, I guess, uh, you know, in, in, in really good streets that are pedestrian friendly um, with cars and bikes, you create friction for the, for the cars. You make it um, hard for them to feel comfortable. Um, so they're always a little bit on edge and looking for bikes, looking for people. Um, you don't, you know, the worst streets that you can build are the ones that are really wide um, because they just create um, a feeling of, um, you know, there's nothing in front of me and I can go as fast as I want to. So, um, you know, the more things that we can put in their way, the better it is for pedestrian and bikes. And that street is, is a high, I would call it a high friction street. 
you know, the other, um, the other thing that I, or the other example that I think is really worthwhile is, you know, anytime that we can add all of the roundabouts and medians and things that Jessica designed into um, those scenarios, um, those are also um, really good um, conditions that, um, you know, car cause cars to slow, cause cars to um, be concerned about what's around them. Um, and again, I, um, I'm pretty familiar with um, you know, a lot of the conditions that they build into in, in Boulder and throughout their, their neighborhoods, throughout their commercial districts, they have, um, you know, all kinds of different treatments from elephant ears at their intersections to many roundabouts in the intersections. Um, any place where they can drop in something that um, makes drivers um, uncertain and makes you move, uh, move slowly. I would agree with her. <laughs> that would be my opinion. I think, you know, what I told the neighborhood is that the, the shared, the advisory bike lane is kind of the starting point, and then you add your traffic calming on top of it. You can do chicanes, we can do a mini roundabout, we could do speed hills. I know everybody loves speed hills, but there are other options that really cause drivers to hesitate and slow down while still allowing our plows to be able to maintain the road properly and get snow off of it efficiently and still facilitating those pads. I think the biggest concern out here is if we, if we do just the roadway or we consider the roadway without any sort of improvements or we do the roadway with bike lanes, we aren't considering those pedestrians. And I think the advisory bike lane really does consider the pedestrians as well. Yeah. One thing to consider it also, um, since Matt is here and listening, um, is that um, adding a traffic calming um, really does affect the maintenance operations. Um, you know, it makes it harder, um, slower. They have to be more careful. Um, so um, Matt um, is not a, as big a fan of um, traffic calming as Jessica and I are. Fine speed bumps, the speed bumps are fine. <laughs> <laughs> You know, there, there are things like soft medians and chicanes we can do that are that can be plowed and, and be facilitated as well. It's just working with the streets department and that and making sure that all works from a maintenance standpoint. Yeah. And to move on a bit, do, do we have traffic data? Um, you know, I, I, I don't observe, I see traffic um, mostly not cut through going to, you know, down Valley, but I, I observe, um, and I've, I've been that traffic sometimes. I will come off of 27th Street, get on to Grand, um, go down to 23rd, take a ride on 23rd in order to access uh, the hospital or public health um, where my wife works. And so that's, I've done that, but I always go down to 23rd and take a ride. I see other people do, but they're people I know. They're, they're, they're going to their neighborhoods, maybe down by Sayre Park, and they're getting off Grand and going a couple blocks. I don't observe a whole lot of people going down 27th Street and then going over on Blake at all. Uh, do we have any traffic counts to talk about that movement or, or how much that's happening right now? Because right now it's a two-way and there's no Blake gate open. So 27th Street right now is the very first opportunity anybody has going into town to get off of Grand and to take an alternate route. Do we have any idea on how many people are doing that? Yeah, I did get, I did happen to get counts during um, our traffic congestion. I got to find the right presentation. I think I provided them to the Transportation Commission. What, what congestion? Um, it was during the fire, it was at the beginning of August. And I want to, I mean, it was like the, the week that everything went to heck in a handbasket. Uh, <laughs> Was so, it that uh, right now, Jessica? Right now, I think it was. Or was it over by the airport? No, it was. It was I, Grizzly Creek, I believe. Oh. Um, let me let me pull that up. What I guess I could tell you what the indications were was that before and after and during is that a lot of that traffic was already going up to Palmer. Um, there's about, I think it was about twice as many cars going up Palmer as Blake. So our traffic calming is working. But let me see if I can pull that up. 
Well, yeah, I don't need exactly. I just kind of want to know, like, is it people going to their homes on Palmer? Is it people kind of, you know, ending up on a, Paul, where do you live? Cresto? Is that the, the little cul-de-sac? Crestwood. Crestwood, excuse me. I mean, is it people, it, did, was there any rhyme or reason on who it was? Was it, again, I, the, my perception is, and I, I want the traffic counts to, you know, back up, it's not people cutting through on 27th Street end up in silt. traffic people start taking 27th and, and start going down 23rd especially that five o'clock just traffic goes up in the summer just like it does downtown and so people start looking for that back route through town to get home on anywhere on Blake Street but again Jessica would have the numbers that's just anecdotal and seeing what happens well, I'll tell you what Jessica while you're looking for that if there's if there's a narrative or just like some like oh yeah this is kind of the people who are using it that that's kind of helpful because if it's neighborhood people um, I'm okay with that. If it's people cutting through on 27th Street and we're making a, a clear path for them to get through town to Newcastle, Silton Rifle, that that doesn't make me feel so good. So while you look for that and kind of think about that, um, I'm done. If Unless you have that answer now. If you don't, I'll just go to Ingrid. I don't fully, but I will say, you know, without origin and destination, we can't really say what it is or what it isn't. Um, it seemed that the pattern was, it was a lot of people coming across the 27th street bridge from the four miles to the hospital and back. Um, but without origin and destination, you can't say for sure that's what it was. Okay. Thanks. Ingrid. Okay. So my question, the transportation commission recommended this option number two that's in our slide up here, the, the 26th street to 27th street. With that scenario, what's the time frame? And this is maybe a question for Matt as well as Terry. Um, what is the time frame and Jessica as well? Like, what's a time frame in order to implement something along those lines? And and I do anticipate that we would want to see something with a designated bike lane. What does that look like for you guys? Is it a uh, month out? Is it six months out? <laughs> what needs to be done? The so one way condition could be set up tomorrow with a barricade. Um, you know, yeah, that's easy. The, um, the raised sidewalk and trying to create a, you know, a, appropriate um, pedestrian lane through there. Um, you know, um, basalt is an example of, um, you know, the, the use of those candlesticks to designate a, um, a pedestrian way through there. If you're familiar, um, there's just, there's an area um, just a nor north of the, um, of the Willits development that has that um, so my guess is that, you know, we could do something out there in pretty short order. You know, I don't, Jake's not on, he's our, uh, he's our master of, uh, of candlesticks and ordering those kinds of things, but I bet you it's less than a month that we could get everything out there. Okay. And then, okay. I think that answers my question. I'm just kind of curious the different scenarios, obviously, you know, if we keep it as is, there's, there's no scenario there really to change. Um, Okay, perfect. Thank you, guys. I appreciate that. Oh, further questions? Um, yeah, just real quickly, clarity on this is nothing is going to change until uh, the reason we're doing this is because we need to make a decision the, for the developers, right? They need to know what to do. It's not any of these options would be further down the road until occupancy or a certificate of occupancy. Is that correct? Okay. I, I, just want to make sure. I think we can do it at any point, though. I think their condition is one that's an occupancy, right, Matt? Terry? That's, I think that's what council decided. Yeah, I think so too. I think Polly and the condition was that um, it was at TCO where the gate would open um, and then, you know, that full, that effect would, would occur. And TCO would be where we would have, um, you know, the, all of the residents, you know, moving through the intersection. So I think that that would be the time where we would want to um, have something in effect. Well, and to bring up one thing, though, is the way that Bell Rippey currently has their design from Palmer to the gate, we'll call it, or past the gate, is it is a two-way configuration. They already have it designed and laid out that way with the sidewalk and everything else. If council wanted to go with what staff thought, they might reconsider that because they'd have to put in less road and just a little more curb to create that one way, basically, from Palmer heading south down to the gate. So there'd be a major 
there's a major differential between what they have designed now and what staff is actually recommending because they lose an entire lane. So I think that if council doesn't like that idea, um, we move forward with two-way configuration of the Blake area, but isn't, isn't that part, part of the point, Terry, is they kind of want to know what to do? <laughs> yeah, no, I agree. And, but I would also say, and correct me if you think I'm wrong, but you know, um, Jessica uh, worked with a developer to um, create you know, um, some traffic calming essentially um, coming um, from the gate, um, you know, in front of the development, um, as well as a multi-use path on the um, on the east side. Mm -hmm. So in my mind, if the council wanted to choose a one-way condition, um, you know, past the driveway entrance, um, the current, you know, driveway entrance for Blake, um, you know, um, to the south, further south, I bet you we could block that lane with a barricade. What do you think? I can block any lane with any barricade you want. Yes. <laughs> I'm, open just, gate tomorrow. <laughs> I'm, I'm just thinking that that could be, um, you know, a, a temporary solution if we wanted to, you know, take traffic counts and figure out how things are going to work or, you know, allow a little bit more flexibility until we have um, more certainty, I guess. So follow up question to that then is if they went ahead and built that, there would also allow parking on that side of the street instead of no parking, right? I mean, there's other options to use that space if they go ahead with what we've asked them to do in the past. And at this point in time, if I remember correctly, and, and I do know this, is there's no parking over there. So <laughs> having that opportunity would probably be good with the having Rafta's bus station there and stuff like that. It would certainly be used, that's for sure. There's a, uh, like you, you know that there is no parking out there. Right. Thank you. Ingrid, other questions? This is just a follow-up to what Matt just said, and that is if Bell Rippey does a design based on our feedback and council decides that they want to do a one-way, if we, because in some of the dialogue we've discussed, like having it be a, a short-term solution to see how it works out. And what if six months or a year after that, we were to change it back to two-way, does that necessitate them changing? And, and if so, what does that look like? Is that doable? Jen's lifting her finger. <laughs> so we're at the point essentially of signing the development agreement and we would record the um, construction documents with that, including uh, the engineering estimate and take um, money. So uh, for, the, for the public improvements. So, I mean, I think the, the timing is, is very close to now. Um, they do need to make some changes based on what Jessica um, has given them as comments. Um, and I haven't had an opportunity to talk with Terry or Jessica about that to see if they have, or Trent, um, to see if they have um, addressed those conditions. But I think we're very close to signing a development agreement. And then they would build it per the development agreement, whatever those public improvements are that are part of the project. Thank you. Shelley. Just one more quick question for staff on the on this uh, option that you that staff is recommending, which is the one way from is it 27th to 29th or where where the gate is now? Not, yeah, not it's as from far as the, the driveway, the new driveway um, to the south to the gate where you know, or actually probably to the rat or to the Walmart entrance there. So one way between okay. those two points. And that put, so that pushes anyone that's leaving the new development has to go south to get to Highway 82. They can't go to 27. Just to clarify that. Um, so, they can, go ahead, Jessica. Sorry. You've got your diagram on. Uh, just trying to get there. Or you were, you were close. <laughs> you were, right. I know. I passed it. I got too fast. There. So from New Palmer to the Walmart entrance would be one way. Would be one way. So, oh, just from that entrance. So they, if they're leaving that development, they would still have the option to turn north. They could, yeah, essentially go either direction. They can go either direction. Okay. And they could turn south as well, Shelley. They, yes. Um, yes. you just couldn't come back to the north from Walmart. Right. From that way. Okay. Okay. Thanks for clarifying that. Any other questions? 
Okay. Um, you want me to go back to the traffic really quick? Yes. Do you have okay. a... Yeah. This is my working file. I, I know I put it into a little more simpler terms in the presentation, but um, these are the counts that I took. Um, for example... You're, you're going to have so, to just interpret it because we can't see anything. <laughs> it's just too small. So just spitball. Oh. Okay, so so it was, it was the week of August 3rd through August 17th. So I took it for a full week. Um, there was a closure of South Canyon westbound closure for a fire. So that fire um, was our peak days. So the conclusion is if you take the actual counts that I counted um, on normal weekend or weekdays, all of we have lower traffic on Blake Avenue from 2015. It's all lower. Um, and then it's even much lower from the projected inflation um, count that we would have gotten for standard growth. But then on the highest traffic days, there was a pretty significant change. Um, the actual count we had during the fire peaked at around 700, a little under 700 cars which still is way below that, that FHWA threshold um, of 6,000 for an advisory bike lane that we have. But that was during the unique situation with the fire. Okay. Um, any other questions? Okay. Uh, are we taking, pub have we taken public comment on this yet? No. Okay. Just. Just check. All right, uh, bring it out to the public. Uh, please, if you are calling in, I see some folks that are calling in, I believe it's star nine to raise your hand. Um, if not, please give your name, address, and you're limited to three minutes. Mr. Steve Smith. There, I think it goes. Thank you, it's nice to be with you. Steve Smith, 63 Airport Road, in behalf of the Management Committee for Glenwood Springs Bicycle Advocates. We respectfully, earnestly, emphatically oppose use of alternative C on Blake Avenue. The so-called advisory bike lane is a questionable makeshift design anywhere. It would constitute an unacceptable safety hazard at this particular location dangerously mixing pedestrians and all levels of bicyclists with motor traffic. Relying on motorists, especially impatient rush hour motorists to even decipher this odd design, let alone patiently weave in and out to accommodate a mix of users is unrealistic. Self-powered travelers fit into three basic categories. First group are bicycle commuters and other skilled experienced cyclists who can safely navigate either on street or on separated routes, traveling 10 to 20 miles per hour. The second group are more casual or recreational cyclists who are generally better suited to bicycle paths and other routes separated from motor traffic three to five miles per hour. The third group are pedestrians and young or novice cyclists who cannot navigate safely on streets traveling one to three miles per hour. Under alternative C, the street itself would in fact be the only option for all those travel travelers giving them a false sense of security. Trying to leverage an experimental bike lane into serving as a combination sidewalk, multiple use path and motor route goes beyond the original design concept of this technique. This design has met with some success in other communities, but only when it either exclusively serves experienced commuter bicyclists or where parallel sidewalks and separated paths are available for slower, lesser skilled cyclists and for pedestrians. Perhaps the worst feature of Alternative C proposal is that it is intended as a traffic calming technique. Traffic calming is a very important goal for this portion of Blake. And there is a wide array of familiar and effective techniques available for that. But using human beings as living bollards to get cars to slow down is a very bad idea. Alternative D is marginally better, but a little better. Installing a walkway with an e edge that's easily mountable by cars, again, invites conflict and safety hazard 
but at least it would provide a demarcated travel way for pedestrians and for lesser skilled cyclists. In any case, please discontinue any further consideration of alternative C or any variation of an advisory bike lane for this portion of Blake Avenue. Thank you very much. Thank you, Steve. Frank Burt. Hi, this is uh, Frank Martin. I live at 805 Crestwood Drive. Sorry, Frank, did I, did I unmute you or unmute you? I'm sorry, I'm trying to unmute you. All right, do you, uh, am I up now? You are, yes, sorry, that might've been my fault. Great. No worries, my name is Frank Martin. I live at 805 Crestwood Drive. Uh, for disclosure, I'm married to count, City Councilor Paula Stepp. These comments are strictly my own. Um, great presentation of ideas, and I like to thank the staff for their thorough um, event, you know, their, their plans on this. I would like to advocate for the neighborhood. I think it's just this Palmer Blake neighborhood. It's it's diverse. It's diverse in terms of families and retired people. Um, and it's, I think it's an ideal neighborhood for what the city wants or the city, city should have. So I uh, hope you bear that in mind. As such, I, I definitely prefer the one-way solutions, um, that particularly would protect the traffic from coming down Palmer, which would certainly create friction between families and aggressive cut through drivers. And I've seen the, the really bad side of that during the bridge closure, uh, which was extreme and with neighbors yelling at cars and flipping them off, neighbors congregating in the middle of the road to slow down traffic and in one point leaving trucks in the middle of the road out of to slow down traffic. Um, there's no sidewalks as, as you know, so it's, it's, uh, it's, it's not a great place for traffic. So I hope you bear in mind the impacts on the neighborhood and and really prioritize that. And uh, the one-way solutions seem to, in, in my mind, it's really protect the neighborhood, the 26th to uh, uh, 27th Street, uh, um, very much protected. And the, just a smaller uh, one-way through the gate would certainly protect the neighborhoods to, uh, to probably a lesser extent, but would achieve that. So. Thank you for your time and I appreciate you hearing my comments. Thank you, Frank. Um, further comments from the public. Uh, Lisa, can we take off the, or Ryan, can we take off the timer? Thanks. No other public comments? Okay, I uh, will bring it back to council for further comments and or motion. Uh, let's see, who do I have up first? I think I have Paula. Go ahead, Paula. Yeah, I, um, I feel like we're not right there yet for two-way traffic on Blake Street. And I'd like to make a motion that we uh, do the temporary test of the one-way traffic uh, from 26th to 27th Street. Uh, at the time that uh, the development gets their certificate of occupancy, try that for at least six months and, and see how that traffic flows. And in the interim, look at our budget and see how we can make, if we're going to in the future, make this an area where we have the kind of traffic flow that the engineering department is looking at, let's first take care of the infrastructure that needs to happen in that neighborhood. We have to put um, sidewalks up. And so I am, I'm making a, a motion to um, not um, let triumph do the job that we've asked the best contract, um, make it one way 26 to 27th street and get the infrastructure in place to take care of two way traffic if that's the way we want to move in the future. And that would include sidewalks. I'll second. Okay, so motion by Paula, seconded by Charlie, further comments? Charlie, go ahead. Thank you. Um, my understanding of the motion, Paula, correct me if I'm wrong, is that 
once the blank gate is open, that is uh, Triumph gets their CO and they're allowed to start using that, that we would open up, that we would close down from 26th to 27th and it'd be one way southbound only. And we try that for six months, but it doesn't change until we council say it isn't one way. Is that right? That's correct. Okay. So I, my comment is, is kind of just one, I appreciate all the work that Jessica and Terry put in this. Um, and I appreciate all the ideas. Uh, my view, and I've expressed this before, so I'll be real brief with it, is um, this is the best solution to keep the additional traffic that would come from Triumph, uh, the Triumph development, Walmart with the lock of the gate, and cut through traffic of people getting backed up on Grand from starting out at 27th and, and coming in there and going all the way down to 10th, 10th, 9th, or 8th on blank. They, they use all three of those interchanges to try to pop back on the grant. Um, I think it's a good start on that. I think we need to protect those neighborhoods. And the, the reason for that street is I think it promotes circulation within that Southeast Glenwood neighborhood. So Palmer doesn't get all that if you do one way in other places on Blake in that 23rd and 27th, it's gonna push traffic in Palmer. I think uh, Mr. Martin mentioned that. Um, and people are just going to go up and around it that way. Um, people do all sorts of things thinking they're going to be faster to get down to 8th, 8th or 9th Street and on the Grand. Whether it's true or not is another issue, but they would, they would do that. I think we owe it to, to protect that neighborhood. If after six months or so, and consider what Paula also said, that we can figure out how to improve that at a reasonable cost in a, in a safe way uh, for both pedestrians, bicyclists, then we can talk about whether we reopen it or not. Charlie. Thanks, Charlie. I agree with everything that Charlie just said. So I'll also be supporting this motion. And it's been a really hard decision because uh, my engineering brain wants to say, yes, I really appreciate what the staff has done and, and that two-way traffic is certainly better. It helps us with the circulation. Unfortunately, that section of Blake though, from 23rd to 26th, is just not built in any type of configuration to handle cut through traffic. And when I look at the rest of Blake from 7th all the way to 23rd, you know, it's a collector street and it, it carries quite a bit of traffic and people definitely cut up at 23rd and get onto Blake headed north when the traffic is, is um, backed up. And they'll do it at 27th too, but right now Blake is in such bad shape that with the potholes and everything, it's not a good way to go. But the minute we improve that and try to make it two way and open up that gate, I just think that that traffic will be worse and that neighborhood can't handle it. So I'm gonna support this right now. I would like to add, Paula, and I, don't, I didn't hear this in your motion, but that we ask staff to do traffic counts, maybe additional traffic counts before and after we make this configuration change so that we really have good data to see the impacts on opening the gate and what that does in, in this neighborhood. Thanks. I would agree to that. Uh, Charlie, Second agree. Second agrees. Steve Davis. Uh, to be clear, what would be the beginning time frame for that motion? When the... Um, at the timing that was already agreed to when that certificate of occupancy happens and um, we were going to open Blake Gate, it would start at that point and um, move forward um, six months and we would decide at that time whether or not to continue it or um, decide where to go from there. Steve, was that your only question? Okay, Ingrid? My only, I'm I'm comfortable moving forward on this. My only apprehension is is that once the TCO is is issued, there is a significant amount more traffic in the neighborhood, and so I'm inclined to say get the people who live there comfortable with this change, and then add the new ones in. And I would actually suggest making the change a month or two before the TCO is issued. But I'm comfortable moving forward this way. I just think it's it's um, something to consider. Um, to that question, I guess staff, is there, what are your thoughts on that? 
Steve Davis, not staff, but go ahead. Oh, you raise your hand. Do you, do you want to comment? No, no, no. I was just, you know, I'm wondering why we don't do it tomorrow. I, I'm with Steve. I, I think the sooner the better. That's kind of where I am. But but ultimately, I'm, I'm comfortable creating some date in the future that kind of aligns with the developer. Um, but I do think that it wouldn't hurt to have it a couple months ahead before the traffic flow really increases. I think the reason we would tomorrow is because that gate does serve a purpose to keep construction traffic protected a bit during the, the construction from what I recall. And also we don't have the improvements to Blake. So there'd be construction while we're, we're have that gate open. Hey, Matt, can you comment about the, um, the need to um, improve Blake between the gate and the Walmart entrance? I think there's some work that would need to be done out there. And I think that, you know, it would take us, um, you know, at least a month to, you know, get a barricade set up and the um, pedestrian protection set up. Um, but, I, you know, from, with the idea of trying to do it in advance of the TCO, um, I think it's not a bad idea because, um, you know, we are lacking data out there and it would be, um, it would be a great um, idea to try to get, um, you know, data before and after. Um, and so, you know, it um, creates a couple of different op opportunities for, um, for us to collect more data before, after, and then before adding the, the new neighborhood in. Well, in, in essence, I mean, they, what we agreed to, and, and Jen can uh, correct me if I'm incorrect, one, one, don't ever say TCO when Jen's in the room. It's a, it's a CO. <laughs> but, um, that's that's thing, what I thought. <laughs> <laughs> but I was like, what? <laughs> the, other, the other thing is, is they're going to open and close that gate for construction traffic. They're going to use it for bringing trucks in and out. We're not opening it right now. I, that, I believe that is what we agreed to is they could use it for construction traffic. And when construction is done, in theory, they'll already have the road built from Palmer over to Walmart in their two lane configuration with a sidewalk curb and gutter and everything we've asked them to do over there, which is kind of why they're waiting for this decision. And I believe there's two traffic calming devices within that kind of section, one right at the concrete uh, connection to the rafter facility and one kind of between Palmer and we'll call it Blake Gate. Um, so I'm not sure how you would do it now because you'd basically be leaving the gate closed because they're using it for construction and then barricading 26th Street. You, they'd love that. I mean, that's only their construction in that little area, I guess. Um, and we still have buses, I think, still using Blake Avenue. I'm not positive what Raft is doing up there. So it seems like you kind of have to wait until they get the piece of road done. The gate is gone. We'll throw some barricades up there, do some signage, and then you're going to have to start counting at that moment, which may be helpful also because then there'll be people starting to live there, which are going to add to those traffic counts, um, which is interesting because then all those people are they can't go into the city without actually going to Highway 82. So you're going to add more traffic to Highway 82. So you've then just compounded a problem um, that you we already have. So I think that's part of the reason I never thought 26 to 27th Street being one way would be great. Now you're going to force everybody who lives in Oakhurst to go to 24th Street, which is in horrible condition also. <laughs> come down a terrible condition Blake Avenue, go up a terrible condition 26th Street and go into to Oakhurst over there. So now you've rearranged traffic in a whole entire different consequ consequential way in itself. So you're kind of not gonna win whatever you decide. That's why we were kind of looking at, okay, if you one way between Walmart and Palmer, at least you let people circulate within the city, but you don't let that massive traffic influx come from 82 and Blake Avenue you're going to continue to let people come on a 27th street, um, which is what happens now. And, and people probably do it, but we have so much traffic calming been in, built into Blake Avenue between 23rd and 27th street. People don't uh, <laughs> probably don't use it a whole lot. So um, Terry, you're the answer to Terry's question is I don't think we do anything because they're going to use it for construction traffic and whatever we build now will get destroyed and they're going to build it anyhow. You're right. I forgot about that. Thank you. Hey, Terry, I don't, technically the traffic report for this new development didn't analyze uh, closure from 26 to 27, that clo it had a closure at 26. So I, I mean, I don't think it affects it significantly, but it does change those counts slightly. 
Yeah, no, I think Matt and uh, you are, you're recognizing the same thing that um, all of the northbound traffic that, you know, if, if any of those residents Oakhurst, um, you know, from 23rd to 26th um, work up Valley, you know, um, they can get out, um, but they can't come back. Um, they have to come back through, you know, where, where they would normally get off on 27th and go to their homes. They're now channelizing all the way to, um, to 24th, 23rd and using roads that, um, you know, as Matt has pointed out, aren't in great shape either. So it was one of the reasons why um, staff wasn't uh, very supportive of the one-way condition. The other thing that I think is a, is a significant impact and um, you know, we, maybe we should stress is that 27th is, is really important for the operation of our um, transit system. You know, RAFTA has a hard time getting in and out of that facility today. Um, if we add traffic to that, um, to that road, um, you know, and we will add traffic to that road with a new development, but if we focus traffic, you know, by creating one-way conditions um, through there, you know, it, um, it could actually prevent Rafta from getting out of their facility. But, um, you know, I think, you know, we, like you guys have implied, we can try things and maybe we should try it and take counts and observe and, um, you know, try to see if there are, um, you know, additional safety issues. Um, because I, you know, I do use that 27th Street intersection every morning and I watch Rafta, um, you know, stage their buses in their driveway there. And, um, you know, I've watched many times where, you know, there are a few cars that are trying to make a, a southbound turn there onto State Highway 82 and Rafta's, you know, staging in their driveway. And as soon as the signal um, turns, they gun their buses out and, they, you know, make that broad turn. And, you know, I, I think that um, we are um, creating a, a Mad Max situation out there. Um, so we'll have to see how it works out. Uh, okay, so I'll say a couple comments before everybody else goes again. Um, you know, we're, we're, we've already had a work session on this, so I, I think we've talked about a lot of this. I can count the votes. Seems like everybody's supportive of 26 to 27th. I know there's probably a lot of clarifying for questions. Um, my preference would be to make a two-way and then see, like, not make a two-way, maintain the current configuration and then see how it goes, take traffic counts. If it's a problem, then we make it one way because then we know. Once it's one way, let's be honest, we'll never change it back. It, it just will be what it will be forever and ever because the same argument we're having now, will it work, will it won't, will be the exact same argument there. So that would be my preference, but it seems like folks want to do it one way first. But um, I guess I would ask um, for a consideration if we do it, can we make an automatic trigger in six months that it go to two weeks, or excuse me, two ways, so that we can see a different configuration and a different thing? We're not gonna know if it's an issue that everybody keeps, or I'm a data-driven guy. If we don't do have the data, we're not gonna be able to make the decision. So the only other way I can think of is it automatically goes to two ways and we try that, and then we make a decision. But if folks don't wanna do that, that's fine. Um, those are my comments. Uh, let's keep additional questions or comments brief. Paula. So to be clear, um, number one, I think either, either I feel like you do on the opposite side, Jonathan, that um, going two ways would mean forever. It's two ways and we're never going to get back to one way. But that being said, part of my motion was let's get the money in the construction that we need done to make that a safe two-way area. And for me, that includes sidewalks to keep pedestrians and bicycles out of the traffic. So hopefully in this interim between the time of um, finishing out the property the development, um, having this trial of having one way there for a while to see what's going on, gives us some time also to consider our budget for 21 and 22, well for 22 at least to say, what do we need to do here like we did it up in Cedar Crest so that these people who live in these neighborhoods can be safe? Um, right now, it's a third world country on some of those roads. <laughs> um, you're, you just you have traffic and you have pedestrians and you have bikes and then you throw in additional traffic and try it for two ways for a while. And I think you're going to hit the same, some of the same problems that Matt just talked about and Terry has talked about. No matter what we do, it's going to be changed. I get it. Um, it is change and that's how life goes, but at least let's get an opportunity to make that neighborhood safe for these people. Okay, Charlie. 
So I guess my only comment was is I thought the idea of doing it a month or two before the CO was issued. I won't use that TCO word with uh, Jen uh, over here. So, um, but it's always hard to figure out when that is. But if, if that would help and give you some, some time, I have no problem uh, if, if Paul would be okay with that starting a couple months before the gate, like gate is bleeding open and you can get some traffic counts before, um, but then it goes six months after and continues until I don't agree with the automatic uh, uh, flip back. So, okay. Uh, any other staff? Or I mean, it uh, looks like uh, Jessica. Yeah, I just I had a clarification question. Do this one way for six months or temporary? We all know temporary isn't always temporary. What kind of improvements between 23rd and 26th are going to be anticipated or are we deferring any improvements or maintenance on that section until a decision is made? Um, as I just said, Jessica, for me, it's finding the, um, opportunity, the funds and the budget um, to make that area safe for pedestrians and bikes next to the traffic that potentially could be two-way there. Um, and for the, re the, for the rest of the council, I mean, each of us are gonna have our opinion, but I just wanna make sure that these roads are safe for the people living in these neighborhoods. Steve Davis. Well, I just have to say, call me crazy, but it, you know, it seems like to me that it might make sense to make this one way once we open the gate. Um, I don't understand keeping the gate closed now uh, Matt says because of construction and no contractor ever in Glenwood has ever had a gate that he could put up just because he had construction going on. All these projects at the Meadows, those streets have been open all the way through those huge uh, projects, uh, just like the, the um, apartment on the other side of town, whatever that is, Oasis Creek. They didn't get to put up a gate just because they were having construction, so... I'm not going to probably support that. I think it ought to be uh, just continue the way it is. And, and I think if we have an issue, uh, we can certainly address that down the road. But I think if the, uh, if the gate was open, it'd be a, a whole nother scenario. So. Shelly, last comments. All the questions. I was, I would just clarify that I think we, we took a vote based on staff's recommendation of keeping the gate closed till the end of construction. So I guess we would need another vote to change that. Um, but then to speak to Jessica's question, I would agree with Paula. I, I would hope that in this next year or so that we would get that section of Lake from 23rd to 26th or 27th upgraded to where it's an actually a functioning street and not just a mis mismatch of potholes and patchwork. And that we will, you know, staff will come up with a design for possibly some form of traffic calming, but, and pedestrian facilities in there. Okay, Ryan, let's call the question. Okay, Mayor Godis. No. Mayor Pro Tem Kaup. Yes. Councillor Wusso. Yes. Councillor Wilman. Yes. Councillor Hershey. Yes. Councillor Davis. I'd say no. Councillor Stepp. It passes five two. Okay. Uh, at seven fifty, we're going to have a uh, another conversation on Southbridge design. We're running a little bit behind. Do you want to roll into it, or does people do people need a break? We are doing just to be clear. This is a motion that's continued. We, public comment is closed. Council general council comments are closed. We're bringing it back directly for. A motion. So do folks want to take a break now or do you want to go right into the motion and discussion? Go ahead, Tony. I would suggest we, what you're saying, Mr. Mayor, is that there'll be no public comment 
can there be a little bit of counsel? I mean, or a motion and then a vote. Is that where, where we are? Motion. We can do council comments on the motion within confines of the motion. Within the confines of the motion. Thank you. And I, I I'm not, don't know how everyone else feels, but I know a lot of people are waiting to hear about this. So I would say steam ahead. Okay. Shelly, is that a thumbs up, steam ahead, or take a break? Steam ahead, steam ahead. Charlie? Yeah, okay. Um, okay. So uh, we'll bring it back. We'll go right into uh, a motion. Uh, Charlie. Mayor, I did have my hand up to make a motion. I, I think you put it down. Mayor, Shelly had her hand up to make a motion. I would ask that you call on her. Yeah, but Charlie did as well. No, I would ask that, I would move that Ms. Kelp be done. Uh, fine, Shelly can, can go first. Thank you. <laughs> we don't need an argument about who goes first. Charlie's hand was up first. I recognize a first person that has their hands up, okay? My hand was actually up first, if you want to count, Mr. Mayor. But if you want to, if you want to go to a, a motion, I will file a mo I will make a motion that Ms. Kalp be permitted to go first. Is there a second? I think that's out of order. <laughs> but uh, I appreciate that. I don't think it matters. Councilor Kalp, if it doesn't matter, go for it. Shelly, I'm sorry. Councilor Yes, sorry. I am ready. Okay. I think without without a lot of explanation, I will I will just like to say that um, I have been involved in the NEPA process for Southbridge from the very beginning, and I believe that it's really it, um, important to stick with the preferred alternative, which is with the tunnel that came out of the process. Could we, could we make the motion and then save the comments for? Sure. So Thanks. I will move to uphold the preferred alternative as decided through the NEPA process for the Southbridge environmental assessment. That is the design with the tunnel that the city moved the design with the tunnel to 100% design and at the same time pursue funding for the project through partners, grants and other means available. Is there a second? I'll second it and now we can discuss. Okay. Discussion, Shelly, your hands up. You're the only hand up. Okay. I'll finish my, my comments. Although the tunnel is very expensive, I realize that, and I am not proposing through this motion that we pay for the tunnel out of the city coffers. But I do believe that we should take it to 100% design since that was the preferred alternative that's approved by the FHWA. Um, and at that point, we can, we can go after partnership funding and through Garfield County, through grants, and we also expect CDOT and RAFTA funding. If we do not get that funding, then I would propose that we put that question to the voters. Do we spend $6 million or whatever the final number is when we get to that design level to put that tunnel under the airport and keep the airport open? Either way, I feel like the um, alternatives that are put forth, the options for shortening the runway, that they are kind of speculative at best at this point. We don't have studies that even show that they will work, but we do know that they will negatively impact the airport. So that's why I put in this motion forward and um, I think it's the best route for the city. Thanks. Thanks, Shelley. Uh, Tony Hershey. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, I appreciate it. Um, I think it was Peter Arnett during the Vietnam War was interviewing a major and this story may be anecdotal, but he said, we'll have to just, we had to destroy the village to save it. I, I don't want to destroy the airport to save it. And if this vote were held a week ago, I might not have supported what Ms. Kalp has done. We certainly discuss a lot of controversial things. I've served on other councils and other jobs or a lot of controversial issues. I've never received so much feedback. Um, I'm concerned that we're sort of building an expensive bridge for $6 million. And Steve Davis very articulately said last time, you know, I'm not spending $6 million for 47 feet of runway. 
And sometimes I feel like we're building this tunnel to save, you know, a steam powered electric shop, a travel agency and a buggy whip store, you know, on top of it. And I hope in the future that is not the case. But I think by cutting the runway, you're you're depriving the airport of its functionality. And if we want to close the airport, that's a vote for another day. But I can't support that. I think it's a unique um, asset and I'm going to support this. But I do like what Shelley said about taking this to a vote to get that other money because $6 million to me is it's not a bridge too far. It's a tunnel too far. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Tony. Uh, Charlie. So oh, I'm, I'm going to have some longer comments and I've written them out because I, I spent a lot of time over the last week, particularly the last several days, uh, trying to make sense of what we're talking about, what we're doing. And like everyone else, I received lots of emails. I think I've spoken to probably somewhere under 10 people, but close to 10 people on the phone who have contacted me. I've returned every call. I read every email that I received. Um, I, I, as a council member, I always felt it's important to be transparent. And as the mayor mentioned earlier, concepts that, and I wasn't named in that group, the concepts that um, we're doing this so we can get a development with a bunch of condos is not anywhere in my, my scope of things. I'm not against the airport operation. But the airport operation is like any other enterprise fund in the city. Enterprise funds are sort of like electric and water and wastewater, and they all have to pay their own way. And, you know, and I think that's important. Um, the supporters of the airport have indicated the airport is a benefit to the city, the things I've read in the emails. And uh, I, I, well, I may disagree an economic benefit that they claim is there. I could accept that for the benefit of tonight's discussion. I don't agree that those numbers are accurate. Um, I've read both studies, both the uh, original study that's quoted by the uh, supporters and read the uh, Gruen and Gruen study, which the city uh, into, uh, we hired and they entered the, a report in August of 2019. Those have significant differences in that. And the reason for that is that assumptions were made in the report uh, quoted by the, uh, the supporters and the Gruen and Gruen uh, personnel, who I also talked to this afternoon, made a lot of effort to do two things. One is to try to get concrete facts about our airport and to talk to the airport users and figure out what they were saying and what, what the reality really was. The only way you get to an economic impact of 17 to 18 million people is if you get the employment directly or indirectly for the airport um, in the area of 50 or 60 people. And, and there is no factual support for that, that type of, of, uh, of, of uh, generation of economic activity. Further, that economic activity, it's not clear in the first the report cited by the supporters, but it is clear in the report cited by Gruen, whatever economic impact, it's a county-wide impact. Um, so it isn't a, it isn't a 17 or 18 million dollar, we're getting that money in, in the coffers. As the mayor noted, our sales tax revenue for every year is in that range. And a big chunk of that money comes from restaurant operations, um, tourism and, and lodging and those types of operations and not um, from people coming in to, from the airport. Going back to the idea that this is a um, enterprise fund, um, the, the airport supporters are asking the entire city population to support the airport operation by funding a $6 million tunnel. There is no money. I mean, just because it's a $50 million, $56 million project with the tunnel, and, and you're asking for $6 million, there's no money. We don't have the money for $56 million. We're hoping to get, uh, we have a $20 million that we've dedicated from the ANI money that we, we've allocated. We've said that's where we're going to go. I think we have another four million from uh, RAFTA, our partnership with RAFTA, uh, and and maybe we're going to get money from a Burke grant, um, but we don't have the money. And if we spend six million dollars here, it has to come from some source. It's my view this tunnel only supports the airport operation. It is only there so the airport can continue to be in the size it is. 
I have a fiduciary duty, and I, when I was elected, a fiduciary duty to the citizens to properly manage state funds. And I believe I've done that, and I intend to continue to carry forward in that and to try to make decisions in a neutral way, not because there's a lot of people supporting this. And I think the airport uh, group has certainly managed and, 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 and got a lot of people to contact us. That's great. I'm glad to see people get involved in the city government. But that doesn't mean that that changes my mind on the pros and cons. Um, Try not to repeat myself here. Um, so I guess it's my view that any future use of this area, we talked about this earlier, we had the meeting of the Planning and Zoning Commission, any future use of the area south of in South Glenwood and the airport in that area is gonna be part of the comprehensive plan that we're just really starting now and will probably be complete over the next year. So that's how I think we address and get the citizen input on, on what the use of that area should be. Um, the uh, other issue, of course, that we're facing, and we got to try to get with the Planning Zoning Commission is, do we have growth or no growth? That's a big issue. We haven't addressed it yet. Um, the, going back to the study, I'm sorry, I'm going to jump around a bit, so let me get back on, on task where I was. The Gruen study looked at the issue of how much economic impact that this has in the city. And the economic impact is $10,300 in sales and property taxes. That's all. Um, there is no other economic impact. If the airport generates 40 plus offsite jobs, and that was reported by some of the airport users that they believe that their, their uh, business was, was supported by the airport, generated 40 offsite jobs. If it does, then there at best is an $8 million economic impact throughout the county. Visitors coming to Glenwood Springs and small planes that can land at the airport, I don't believe generate significant revenue in any way. I haven't seen any data to support that. And I've and actually reading through all the letters and the comments I've received. Lots of people say I fly in and have lunch. I fly in occasionally. I fly over the airport and it looks like a nice place to land if I could land there. Uh, but there isn't any really support. Those people that are coming in on airplanes are spending a lot of money here. Um, and so I don't, I don't think that that's a, that's a factor. The, the, the issue comes up about public safety. First of all, everybody agrees that South, the South Bridge is needed and we must have it for safety and for an evacuation route. And that's becoming critical each year. The longer we delay this project, and the longer it takes us to get this project to completion, the more we are at risk of losing, uh, maybe not the full scope of the, of the lives indicated in the report last week, but a lot of lives are in danger because they can't get out of town in time. So I think we need to get the South Bridge done. As far as firefighting, um, I agree the helicopters are a great benefit in the Grizzly Creek fire and, and apparently the year before in the, in the Lake Christian fire, the helicopters use this space and that can still be done. There's ways to do that without having uh, a full airport. Um, and, um, if we don't get the $6 million from some source, it's gonna even delay this project further. There was comments made in the, in, the, in the supporters that there's FAA funding or should be FAA funding available. We haven't properly explored that. The Gruen report, which these people work at airports all the time, say the airport is not approved by the Federal Aviation Administration. It's on page four of the report. As part of the National Plan of Integrated Airport Systems, NPIA, NPIAS, and therefore is ineligible for federal airport improvement program grants. It simply isn't there. It isn't part of what, what if the FAA funds because they don't fund non-FAA airports. Um, people argue that six million is a small addition to the project as we talked about already. We don't have the funds to do that. And to get another six million is not something that's feasible in the near future. The great thing about the brick grant, if we keep moving forward, and, and I'm going to propose, I'm going to oppose Shelley's motion, and propose a different motion if it fails. Um, but the, the importance is keep moving forward with plans because we want to get the brick grant, or at least part of that. Um, going back to the concept of the the airport being an enterprise fund, if indeed it is there, then the airport operations should, just like any other enterprise fund, support the six million dollar bridge. 
And if the airport supporters can go, and this would include the airport board, I challenge them to go and say, how can we do this? Can we raise user fees? Can we raise other fees in association with the use of the airport such that we can raise sufficient revenue to support a bond issue because enterprise funds can issue a bond issue to pay for this $6 million uh, project. If they can, I'd be happy to change my vote and support a tunnel because then I, I believe they, they're paying for what they're using and what their the additional cost. The city is on a short time fuse. We need to move forward. It's my view that option two, even though it's been said it is not possible because it's gonna lose 43 feet, that we do need to have a further study of that. And, and if this motion of Shelley's fails, I'm gonna I'm going to be moving to ask city staff to immediately uh, look at option two in great detail and see if that can provide a safe and reliable airport. If it can, that solves the problem. We have the airport, we have a few years before we're gonna dig ground, we can work with the maintenance operator, see if he would wanna to move to the north side of the new roadway. We can work with Classic Air Medical. They could be on the north side or the south side of the new roadway and have a helicopter pad, maybe even on the, on the north side. We can still have all those operations uh, in, in emergencies we need it. Um, uh, one other thing in safety I forgot to mention, um, I have not been able to find any support for how many fixed wing aircraft come in and out of the airport for purposes of medical evacuation. We talked about that only can do it by road. Well, we have a classical or medical. They can take someone in a helicopter from Bellevue Hospital to either Eagle or Rifle Airport in minutes. So we're not talking about a long delay by taking someone to an airport that can better handle typical medical aircraft. Very few medical aircraft can, can actually land at this airport. I believe that if it comes back and option two doesn't allow for a viable airport, a viable, useful, safe airport, if we can't do it after the study on the airspace, that we then say, okay, rather than no tunnel, we will do either a tunnel or we take to the voters, do we keep an airport or not? But if we take that to the voters, I think the voters also have to understand that they have to come up and they have to say, we're willing to vote to increase our sales tax, our property tax or something else to support the continued airport operation because that's the only way it can be done. Because if the airport board can't come up with the funds to raise fees to support a bond issue, the only way to do it is to raise funds from somewhere else. Otherwise, we have to take the money from the street tax, which is our only other source of funds, which means we don't get to fix any other streets. There is no great pool of funds to do this. And with that, I will indicate I'm opposing this motion and I'll make an alternate motion if it fails. Thank you, Joel. It is. <clears throat> wow. Well, I'm going to summarize my comments uh, to all your benefit. Um, in the last week, I have not had so many public comments since uh, since the Grand Avenue Bridge project, and a lot of them I can disregard because they're from all over the country. Uh, but the ones that I really listen to are right here in Glenwood. I have felt every possible emotion on this issue. It's a very difficult question. On council, we have the responsibility to make decisions which benefit the citizens of Glenwood Springs to the greater good of all. Often these decisions are subjects that we actually know very little about. I find there's a lot I know very little about. I don't know how the outcome of an airspace study would impact this project or impact the airport. I don't know ultimately what the FAA thinks. I don't know actually how many aircraft are affected here. <clears throat> Glenwood has many needs, not wants. Six million dollars could completely repave and update the underground utilities on re in the Red Mountain neighborhood. And yet I'd had not one comment from anybody in the Red Canyon neighborhood to say, hey, where's my six million bucks? Six million dollars could rebuild Sixth Street from the vapor caves to the tram, which would greatly benefit the economic vitality of North Glenwood. And yet I heard nothing from anybody on Sixth Street about spending this money. 
six million dollars would go a long ways to stimulate the redevelopment of the old sewer plant site that could potentially be the crown jewel of the confluence of our two rivers in this community. Glenwood Springs has not in the past 30 years spent six million dollars on any single project other than the new sewer plant and the 27th Street Bridge. So for me personally, I would never support a single project costing $6 million, let alone to put it all into a tunnel under the runway that serves the few rather than the many. However, I don't just represent Steve Davis here. I represent the citizens of Glenwood Springs. And those who I heard from clearly told me this week to design the tunnel and save the airport for its maximum future potential. I can easily disregard those that I have heard from that don't live here and that live in other places around the country. I can easily even discount what I heard from those who own airplanes and have businesses there because I understand their bias. But I can't disregard the Bill Coleman's the Mary Steinbreckers, the Chris Teresas of our community. And so I am gonna support Shelley's motion. And I know that's shocking to a lot of people because personally, I would never do it. But I think these are the people that I've heard from and I'm listening to my constituents. I'm gonna jump in with a few comments. You know, there is no free lunch. I agree with everything Steve Davis said and Charlie and everybody, but this money has to come from somewhere. Despite what people say, Charlie mentioned, there is no magic grant ferry that's gonna pay for a $6 million tunnel to keep alive an airport that is not a commercial airport. Uh, it's not an FFA airport, doesn't carry cargo. It's not a regional transit center. The streets, our total streets budget is $2 million. A million of that is striping, snow removal, signage, debt service, and basically patches of potholes. So to come up with that $6 million, we're going to need to take a million dollars a year out of that streets budget. Um, and that means for six years, we're gonna squirrel away this money for this tunnel for 43 feet, potentially a runway. And I don't know that it's 43 feet. I've been told by our staff that it's 43 feet, but maybe it's 143 feet. That is an insane amount of money. And I would say the same thing to Councillor Davis. I, I, I've, I've experienced the same thing. Uh, you know, in fact, every email I got from somebody from the front range, it, 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 didn't, it didn't register at all for me. Um, it just meant the people who want to save it are very good at organizing uh, throughout the state. But so community, be prepared for six years of no more street reconstructions. We burned through our reserves during the Crestwood neighborhood last year. Um, be prepared for um, a tunnel. Six more years of wondering every year during fire season, is this the year? Is this the year that a Lake Christie forget about these troublesome fire or all the other fires we've had? Every year, people in my neighborhood and up four mile are going to have to load up their cars because it's happened every year for the last three or four years. We've had Lake Christine. We've had Coal Seam. We've had Grizzly Creek. We've had Storm King. It's not like we're new to this or these are some hypothetical fires that happened in Montana in Yellowstone in 1988. These are happening every single year. Every single year, I've loaded up my car for the last three or four years thinking this is, this is the time. We have six more years of that minimum just to prepare the community, my neighbors in South Glenwood and the community of four miles. So just that's what to expect. Please the rest of the community, as Steve Davis mentioned, streets aren't going anywhere. They're going to anything that we're able to do, mill and overlays, chip seals, all of that is now on the table. Um, you know, the other thing six years does is it's time value money, interest rates. It's also the ability to um, have the, inflationary costs go up. 
Construction costs go up at 5%. That's two and a half million dollars added to this project every year for the next six years. That's an additional 15 million by the time we get around to building this. Completely forgetting about the health and life and life and death safety issues for my entire community here in South Glenwood. And, and I am not just speaking as the word representative for South Glenwood and, and Four Mile, uh, my neighbors and friends up Four Mile, I'm speaking for the whole community who are going to have to make significant sacrifices. There is not a money tree. There is not a, a big pot of money somewhere like everybody says, oh, well, you know, brings in $17 million. It doesn't. That is factually incorrect. So just, I'm just telling people whenever they say, oh, we want this or why are our streets? This is one of those reasons why. We heard, I have heard probably in the last two years, so many people complain about how, how much money, ridiculous money went into designing, redesigning, building, rebuilding, um, making 7th Street. And 7th Street and Under the Bridge is, is wonderful. It's absolutely wonderful. But I heard so many people who are upset with that money. Guess how many people ever came before city council or called me up to say, don't spend that money? Tony Hershey. Tony Hershey was the only one. And I gave him credit for that. People don't speak up and say, you know, oh, save that money for, for my street. They just, they just don't. That money, people just think, well, my street's bad. The city will figure it out. There will always be money somewhere. It'll always happen. And it doesn't. And we're going to have to make really, really hard decisions for the benefit of the 40 pilots that use it. Um, I do not support this motion. Um, I think that the people who benefit from it are not the citizens. It's not at large throughout the community. Uh, the hospital uses classic air medical for uh, helicopters. There's no firefighting operations that use fixed wings. They are all 100% helicopters. And in fact, if you ever did try to take an air tractor or any fixed wing aircraft out of the Arglow Springs airport, you would foreclose upon any opportunity to use helicopters. So it's absolutely not gonna ever happen. So it's not there to fight fire. It's not there for the larger community. I don't know what we're doing, but I would say the people who use it have to pay for it. And so I'm gonna have a conversation. We're gonna have a, a council conversation on user fees because user fees are gonna to have to go up to the point where we're able to bond for this. If that's the other way. So if, get ready airport users for fees to go up significantly because someone has to pay for it. There's no free lunch. And I don't think the rest of the citizens throughout the community should have horrible streets, horrible infrastructure, crumbling water mains and sewer pipes because people enjoy flying in and out of that airport. Ingrid. Well, on that note, um, you know, ultimately, I think that I'll start by saying that I received so much feedback in the last week that it actually was really endearing and, and it made me realize how passionate people are about, about their community and the amenities within their community. And they are maybe willing to make sacrifices. Um, and there may be a dialogue as Jonathan or Mayor Gotis just mentioned, um, that we will have to offset these, that we will have to pick one over the other, that you can't take two vacations in the same year, just like any fiscally responsible family, there has to be a budget. But ultimately, I don't believe that it's the seven of our decision to make on whether or not we keep this, this amenity. And I don't think that I'm in any place to place judgment on who uses it and who values it. I receive feedback from my ward, which is on the total opposite end of town from people who I know are not in aviation, um, passionately asking me to vote not to shorten this runway. By shortening this runway, we are in effect making two decisions. We're making a decision that does, it's a fiscally responsible decision and it, it reduces the cost of Southbridge by approximately 10%. But in making that decision, we're also making a huge decision about the functionality of the airport, but we're not being very clear about it. And we're not asking the people of our community, our voting constituents. 
And I took an oath of office to be fiscally responsible, but I also took an oath of office mm -hmm. to enact the will of the people. And it feels like a contradiction here. Um, and so without a governing document from the people or a vote that says we're comfortable letting go of the airport or reconfiguring it, I am not comfortable supporting this. Um, you know, I can say so many of the same, the, the same echoes of what Steve's comments were. And that is, you know, I took a lot of that feedback and I'll be honest, I dismissed a lot of it from people coming from out of town because they won't be responsible for any increase in their tax rates or to, you know, to weather the cost of this project. But when I kept getting feedback from commu community members who I admire, who I, I have a lot of respect for and who I know have the best interest of our community in mind, I can't move forward on shortening this runway at this point in time. Now, are there alternatives and will I look at alternatives? Totally, let's look at alternatives. Let's find an option that's not a $5 million cost to our community members and, to, and that makes it so that we have to pick airport over roads, it, you know, I don't want to have to make those decisions. I wish that we had enough in our coffers to fund all these projects and to make sure that the airport's not even in the condition that it's in right now. That's a concern as well. But I'm not going to talk about developing the airport because that's, that's one, I'm one voice here. And I want a lot more feedback before we make a decision that impacts our community so directly. And on that, I think I've pretty much stated my position on this. So thank you. Thanks, Paula. Shelley, when you made this motion, can you um, give me some clarity? Did you say that the, did your motion include the fact that we would not pay the additional 6 million? Um, or is there any parameter to your motion that we would pay up to what the city has already committed at 20 million? And if, if there was more than that, then we'd go back to the voters. I did not include that in the motion, but I am open to considering that. I did include that kind of as an after statement or before statement that it's really not my intended, it's not my intent to use city money to do that. I, I see that tunnel as part of the whole project. It's the preferred alternative of the NEPA process, which took many years to go through. And um, so I see it as part of the cost of the whole project. And when we go seek funding from partners, we are seeking funding for the whole project. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, so I'm, I've listened to all of you and, and um, agree with everybody, <laughs> but here's the thing. Um, I do believe in the fiscally responsible part of this. I know we're looking, I'm gonna take one thing that I know is right before us and what are we gonna do about water rates because we don't have the infrastructure in town that we need and we need to increase our rates for water. And, and we're looking at uh, a schedule that could mean that every citizen or every home in this town is gonna to pay up to 200 bucks a month for water within 10 years. We're, that's, that's on our citizen's shoulder. This is, this is a citizen's question whether or not we're gonna spend this kind of money for um, allowing the runway to be just the way it is right now. I think there are opportunities for this runway still to support um, our helicopter traffic, still to support the small craft, although we did not hear from our local pilots how many small craft could still use an airport um, that was shortened by 42 feet. We've just heard what the bigger guys can't do. So there's um, some problems in not getting enough information um, so that we can make an adequate decision. That would have helped. It would also have helped to had the airspace analysis done in front of us and know what that cost was and know that opportunity there on the opposite side of things. So number one, I firmly believe that we have a lot of issues in our town that we need to pay for and $6 million will pay for it um, or pay for some of it, at least get us started. Um, I still solidly believe, believe this is on county property and the county commissioner should be sitting at the table with us trying to figure out how to pay for this. Um, and that would help mitigate some of our concerns on bearing the brunt of this cost and not knowing in our future what this is actually gonna cost the city. I won't 
spend a penny more than $20 million on this airport. That's what we've committed to. We have to find the rest of the funding. Um, the airport um, could end up slightly smaller, um, but if we look at the way air traffic is going, um, uh, Terry had mentioned that these um, aircraft that are privately owned right now, that private own ownership is dropping. There is some new technology coming in with air aircrafts that are more maneuverable and don't need the space that we currently provide on our airspace. So there, I think there's opportunities for our airport in the future, even if it's smaller. Um, and so I, I'm going to have, I'm going to say I cannot support this motion right now because it's six million dollars and I think we have some other options. I think there's some cost to that other option that Charlie um, may be put into a vote if this does not pass, um, may be put forward as a motion, but I think in the long run we can't afford the additional six million and we can't afford to say we're going to commit to that um, if that's built and we can't find the funding. Well, Charlie. And I maintain a lot of times, so I'm not going to repeat what I've already said. I, I'm only going to kind of respond to what uh, Steve Davis said, and, and Steve and I agree on a lot of things. And um, my, there are a lot of people that I heard from, and, and like Steve, that are people that I, I, I value their opinion, I trust their opinion, but I'm not sure that when they said, yeah, I support the airport, they understood that that might mean that either we can't fix Red Mountain to make sure it's adequate fire flow at Red Mountain, um, although that hopefully will be supported through the water rate, so I don't want to go there, but we might not be able to fix the streets even if we get water flow up there because we have to spend the money here. Um, if the people were asked the same question, would you support the airport if you were going to increase sales or use or some other revenue where you had to help pay for it, you had to directly pay for it. I wonder how many of those people would still be there. Maybe all of them, I don't know. I just think that they have not conceptually, when they talk about supporting the airport, the airport they haven't understood that they're, that they might mean that they have to find the funds to pay for it. It may have to come out of their pocket. And, I, and that's why I can't support this. My alternate to this was that we don't build the tunnel, that we direct staff to immediately engage in determining whether or not option two would give us a reasonable, safe airport. And if it does, then we have a solution where we don't need to build a $6 million tunnel. If not, then we go to the voters and say, do you want to spend this money? Do you want to spend $6 million? And if so, are you willing to support it by property tax increase, a sales tax increase, or some other funds? And let's see whether they still feel that this airport is that important. If they do, great, then we have the funds to pay for it. And, and I'm not trying to say, you know, I told you so or any of that kind of stuff. I just think my duty, like Paula's, we have a fiduciary duty to spend the money wisely and building a tunnel for the number of people who use the airport right now is not a good use of our financial resources. Shelly. And I, I would just like to be clear on my motion. My motion is not to spend the $6 million on the tunnel. My motion is to stick with the preferred alternative that came out of the NEPA process. Because right now, it took us 13 to 14 years to get to where we are and to get that FHWA approval on NEPA. If we go and we change design right now and we head off in a different direction that we're not even sure if we'll work, we could be looking at another three to four year delay. We don't know. And, and there's talk of infrastructure funding coming online from different sources. And it our safest route right now, in my opinion, is to stick with the design that's approved. It's a preferred alternative out of that process. We move it forward. We get it shovel ready, basically. We go after the funding. This, this motion, if approved, still leaves us the option, if we don't get the funding we need, to say, we don't have that $6 million, we go to the voters. And if at that point we have to do that, then that's where we are. And that's a decision we can make then. And if we have to look at alternate designs then that don't include the tunnel, then we can do it at that time. But, but right now, I don't think we can afford the delay 
And I don't want to build a delay into the Southbridge project right now when, when there is a possibility that we can get the funding for the total project if we pursue it. So that's my motion. Steve Davis. Okay, just my final follow up. Um, just to be perfectly clear, I am not at all happy about supporting this motion. Never would I ever think that we're gonna pay 100% of this project. If we were, it would never happen. It's right now at 56 million, the city would never pay that kind of price. If we're committed at 30% of the project, and that's a $6 million tunnel were, you know, 2 million bucks, but I also can't help but think that in the next, if we don't, we first have to get partners and other funding in place. And uh, if we don't, it could be five years or who knows when we actually get this thing shovel ready. We may never get it shovel ready if we don't find partners and other money in this thing. But at some point in time, we're going to have to be back at the table and we're probably going to be value engineering this thing one more time and trying to figure out uh, if we can, if we didn't get the funding or the partners, uh, what corners are we going to cut? And this is going to be one we'll be looking at. Say my last comments. I think that this kills the bridge. I think that this pushes it out six years. I think it bankrupts our streets funds. I think the rest of our community is gonna suffer. I think that I read an article from 2003 that estimated this with the tunnel of 37 million. Now we're at 57. In six years, it's gonna be 77. That adds a $20 million to it. If we don't start construction on this by 2025, we have to give back our $5 million federal year mark. And we have no path forward right now. We're hoping the administration, the Biden administration has infrastructure funds. We're hoping that we qualify for it. We're hoping this BRIC grant, which is a one in a hundred chance comes through. Hope is not a strategy. Hope is not a strategy when, when and I'm sorry I'm passionate about this guys. Like I, I this is not, I don't lay down and pound my fist on the table except that, well, for South Midland, apparently I did that a couple of years ago for those of you who are there, but this is really visceral. I've loaded my car up a lot. Uh, you know, I, I drove through that Grizzly Creek fire, you know, I had the opportunity um, it, to drive through that Grizzly Creek fire and see that devastation. I drove through No Name with, uh, with Gary Tillotson and saw those homes and the sprinklers on them and the firefighters clearing stuff away. So I'm sorry that's a little more emotional for, for me in South Glenwood, where I live and my friends up four mile, this is not, everybody thinks there's always the money out there and there's just not. And, and it, 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 it scares me to kick this can down the road. And I think this is a decision that's going to come back and haunt us. And I hope to God it's not. And, and, and I'm, I'm being emotional. I'm not talking about facts and figures and all that. I just know that kicking this cane down the road costs millions of dollars every year that we do it. And what we've done is we've increased the cost and we've decreased the likelihood that we can get this done on the hope that there's federal money going to rain down from somewhere. So, Ryan, let's call the question. All right. Councilor Step. Go. Councilor Wilman. No. Councilor Wusso. Yes. Mayor Godis. No. Councilor Hershey. Yes. Councillor Davis. Can't say maybe. <laughs> Gotta say yeah. Can you abstain? I could abstain. <laughs> abstain is a vote for yes. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Was that a yes? I guess so. 
and Councillor Cout or Mayor Pro Tem Cout. Yes. <laughs> Motion passes four three. Mr. Mayor, can we take a brief break? Yeah, Charlie, is that what you're going to suggest? I'm sorry. Uh, no, action is going to make another motion. Uh, on the same topic. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead, Charlie. Oh, I move we direct city staff to proceed uh, to examine option two as identified in last week's meeting to determine if we can have a usable safe airport and report back to us as soon as possible. Well, is that Mr. Mayor a motion or is that just more sort of direction? Because I would support that as direction. It's a motion. I understand it's a motion, <laughs> but I'm not going to vote for it. <laughs> I think, I think there's, there's significant funds associated with that um, because there would need to be an airspace study to, to confirm that. So there, there's time and work and funds of, uh, associated with that. So I think a motion is probably appropriate. That's what I'd ask. Thank you. So, Tony, was that a second? Okay. I will second that. Uh, questions, uh, Ingrid? I'd like some clarity on what that entails and what kind of cost would be incurred in that. Terry, would you be able to answer that? Yes. Um, so if we were to pursue option two, um, we do need to do an airspace um, study as Jonathan has said. Um, so the estimate on the airspace study right now is um, between 50 and $60,000. Um, we would also need to um, revise our um, environmental assessment to allow for the shortened runway. So this would be- um, Hold on, Terry. Terry, let me, let me stop you. My motion was just to do the airspace study spend that 50 or 60. So that's all, I'm, that's all my motion was intended. So if it said something else, I apologize. No, all right, um, so I'm gonna revise. Um, so if we were just gonna do the airspace study, just to see if that option is, um, is at least viable from a beginning standpoint, you know, the starting cost is 50 to 60,000. If we were to take it any further than that, um, you know, to try to replace um, the tunnel option, then we have to revise our environmental assessment, and that is another two hundred thousand dollars. Thanks, sir. And and Ingrid, to be clear, those are just the design costs. Um, to go further than that, you know, adds to the construction cost, and that's on the order of probably about five hundred thousand. So we would spend a significant amount of our entire budget that we're already lamenting about spending, potentially just looking at an alternate that we may not end up using. If I, my view, rhetorical question. Quick to say no, my <laughs> reason I, I said to Ingrid is that if we can spend 50 or $60,000 and that shows that we could get an airport, then we can revisit the tunnel. If, sure. if we can't, and these other costs. That's all I'm suggesting is to spend that. I, I agree. I don't want to get any other costs unless we know we can get a viable airport. That was my original intent in coming in here tonight is to get that study done quickly. Okay. And then Carl also had a comment. I was just trying to clarify that I that I think what Charlie's motion was was just the 50 or 60 as additional information. It wasn't the 500. Okay. Uh I would say I'm supporting that motion only because I think that that's information that we need to have if we go to a vote of the people. If the people are going to be asked to fund this, they need to know when we say 43 feet and the opponents say, no, that's not 43, it's this. We don't. I think part of the reason we're doing a tunnel tonight is because we didn't have the final answer on that. And if it is 43 feet or 143 feet or 430 feet, those things all make a big difference. And so I think spending 60,000, we need to do as, as a way to understand what we're going to the voters potentially for. So okay. in that same vein, is there anything else that we should be directing staff and or voting on that would be components of this decision that we feel like right now would be a good opportunity to discuss it and make sure that we're doing that as well. 
great question. Uh, Terry? I'm sorry, I didn't understand the question. Yeah, so Jonathan just said that this, this study would allow us to give information to the public in the event that we go and it's on the ballot and we vote on it. And I asked, are there any other data points or studies that you feel would behoove us all in better understanding the best direction for the airport? I think the airspace study would clarify whether the, the runway is, is viable from a horizontal and a vertical standpoint. Um, the other thing that I could imagine that the council would be asked about would be, um, you know, effects of a shortened runway on the overall business prospects of the airport. So, um, you know, the, the maintenance hangar um, under a shortened runway is um, disconnected from the, from the runway. So they, um, I could imagine that the council would um, have questions, yeah. comments about, um, you know, the the business impacts. And so that would be another um, another potential sticking point question. I okay. would throw in potentially knowing the number of planes out there, right? That is something we simply do not know, and maybe knowing. The number of flights that come in and out you guys might want to know uh, charlie i have no idea how much that costs well it's a game camera <laughs> um go ahead steve and then shelly well I, I you know i like the idea of, of remaining uh, flexible and i think these are goes this goes back to the uh, beginning of my statements where I said that I find that there's a, there's a lot I don't know. And we're asked to make decisions about things we have no knowledge of. Um, we buy studies all the time. And oftentimes we do absolutely nothing with them at the end of the day. And, and maybe that's what this one would be, but I will support Charlie's motion uh, because I think that airspace um, study is going to be really important in the future, uh, whether we use it or not. And, it, and I would like to say, too, it doesn't matter how many airplanes we have out there. Um, you know, the thing to consider is how many airplanes it actually affects to have a shorter runway. Uh, a lot of those airplanes out there doesn't make any difference to them at all. Some airplanes it does. So we should know that. Is that a suggested amendment to Charlie's motion? Uh, I don't know if I went that far. It was comments on the motion. <laughs> I will go that far then. Yeah. Charlie, Charlie would amend that motion. It seems like it would be good for us to know what airplanes are out there, who they're owned by, what kind they are, um, and how many daily flights come in and out of that airport. Kelly. And Terry, uh, you have to accept oh, that. Hold on. I, just want to get, I, I may or may not, but I just want to find out from Terry, do you have any idea what that would cost to add those components? You know the I identification know of the uh, of the um, air um, aircrafts at the um, at the airfield right now, and um, you know understanding whether or not they could use that shortened runway. We have we did request that information from the um, airport board, um, and and they didn't provide it. Um, we can um, ask again, and or we could um, you know um, use our our right as the um, the owner of the airport to go and open the airport and find that information ourselves. And so I think that we can. Sorry, Terry, you're muted. Did you guys hear any of that or was I just babbling? No, just the last 30 seconds. Oh, sorry, I, there was some echoes, so I tried to mute. Um, 
somebody that had their microphone on and I think I ended up muting you, I apologize. But it's just the last five seconds of what you said. So in short, Charlie, I think we could find that information without additional costs. So what air, where, air, what aircraft are on the, um, on the airfield and whether or not they could use a shortened runway, I think is an analysis um, that's, that's without cost. Um, the, the idea of um, figuring out um, how many flights are coming in and out, um, I think Brian has had some thoughts about that already, you know, installing a game camera. And I bet you between Brian and Alyssa, that's a pretty low cost um, item. Um, so I don't mm -hmm. anticipate a lot of additional cost. Okay, then I, I will agree to that amendment. I assume you'll check and agree on that in a second, Mr. Mayor. <laughs> I would. Okay. Kelly, go ahead. Okay, Terry, I had a couple of questions on um, A, where would that study be paid from? Would that be come from the earmark funds? Yeah, I think we would continue to use the earmark, earmark funds. Um, we are um, coming to the end of our earmark funds. We have about $1.6 million in that original um, $5.5 .5 million um, left from the um, federal earmark funds. Um, that said, you know, we, we do have enough budgeted in 2021 um, to, um, you know, finish the current contract we have. We actually have an amendment um, from Jacobs that the council hasn't considered yet that I hope we'll be able to bring to the next um, council meeting um, on the 18th, um, which involves utility work and um, additional reconstruction work for the um, airport center drive. Um, but with, um, you know, the amendment we have, um, and um, the current work that's underway, um, I believe that we're, um, we're covered by the federal earmark and um, by our current budget. And we still have um, some cushion left um, in the order of about five or 600,000. Okay, so does this, it, will this study at all affect the bandwidth and your department or anything as far as moving the preferred option to 100% design? time-wise no. or it won't delay it? Nope, we, uh, we have the airport designers already working um, side by side with the structural engineers. It, it won't delay us. It's ready to go. Okay, thank you. Ingrid. I have one quick question and that is, is there a time, how, what is the duration? Are we gonna do this? Is it three months, six months? How, you know, what does that look like? And historically in the course of a year, is there one season that we have seen that historically always has more flights come in? I wanna make sure that we're getting data that's real data over the course of a year, instead of taking a snapshot and saying, you know, it's December and you get snow in December, but you know, it's not the same in June. You know what I mean? Do you see what I'm saying? Okay, thanks. Yeah, yeah. Um, so um, the airspace study itself has to be done um, with LEAF on. Uh, so starting in May and um, my understanding is it'll take us 90 days to have a determination after um, the, um, the aerial photography is done. Um, but um, the counting of the planes, I bet we can do, you know, continuously, you know, starting in, you know, a couple of weeks um, up until the time that we want to make a decision about the, um, the, you know, the airspace study itself. Um, and, you know, that'll probably be in August. So I would guess that, you know, if we started in another, let's give it a month, um, we would have a little bit of winter data and we would have some summer data. And if I had to guess, I would guess that there were probably more um, flights during the summer. Okay, thanks, Terry. I think that's all my questions for the evening on this subject. Thank you. All right, uh, so there's a motion and a second. Um, Ryan, let's call the question. Steve Davis, do you have a, sorry, your hand's up, it's waving. Yeah, wasn't my hand up? Sorry, one last question for uh, Terry. So this airspace study that you do, will it uh, define our, our existing conditions as well as some uh, other condition that you might dream up? The plan, whatever that was, option two, option one, whatever the option is. So there are, um, there are two options. Um, and the option one is the, the shorter runway. I think we ended up at 2,882 feet. Um, and option two, um, you know, that number's not sticking in my head, but we are about 42 feet shorter than, um, than our current runway. 
Um, so I would analyze option um, two only because it sounds like that's what the council prefers and it will cut the cost of the study, the analysis down. Um, if we do both studies, that um, that fifty to sixty thousand was for both alternatives. So I, and I you, my question was, would it address uh, existing conditions out there? And it sounds like it would not. It would I mean, not. I, if you did an existing condition airspace study, if if it would even come back in a favorable condition or not, it might not. And it might not. Um, so Terry, you said that that 50, 60 encompasses both options. So are we just assume it's more like 30, 40, if it's just the one option, uh, option two that you'd be evaluating? I think so. I mean, I, I, I don't have uh, Jacobs on the line to confirm it, but yes. <laughs> All right. And my motion was just option two. So I did not ask for both options because I don't see option one as a feasible thing. It's cutting off too much of the airport. I, even I can believe that wouldn't work effectively. Okay, Ryan, let's call the question. All right, Councillor Hershey. No. Mayor Pro Tem Cow. Yes. Councillor Davis. Yes. Councillor Willman. Yes. Councillor um, Wusso. Yes. Councillor Stepp. Councillor Stepp. I thought you heard me, sorry, yes. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Councillor Willman. Yes, again. Oh, sorry. And Mayor Govis. I think I, I think I wrote about it. <laughs> uh, yes, sounds like it passes uh, 7 1, huh? 6 1. No, 7 1. Charlie <laughs> voted twice. Oh, yeah. So, uh, well, mm -hmm. there you go. Jonathan, can I clarify one thing before we um, finish the item? Uh, do you need more further direction? I, I do want to make sure that I understand it. Yeah. So my understanding is that the council wants us to proceed with the, the tunnel design um, and to analyze option two in an airspace study. And additionally, identifies for staff to identify the planes and uh, the number of flights out of that, that what we, we had said before. Yep, I understand, thank you. And for clarity too, the, the motion was to proceed with the, take the tunnel design to 100%, but also um, that we need to start pursuing real funding for the project. Okay, thank you. Not that that's all on you, Terry, but. <laughs> Yeah, we are proceeding. We're we are um, looking for real funding on the project, Shelley. Right. <laughs> <laughs> we work on it every day. <laughs> All right. Uh, thank you, everybody. We got through this. Emotional, mostly by me. Um, let's uh, let's take a full ten minutes before we get back to our agenda. We'll reconvene at nine oh five. Thank you.
Ingrid, I think the dog should vote. Who should vote? No. My dog. That's a, yeah, we have a rule. Every meeting, just one. <laughs> she gets to be seen once. Oh. We can't allow dogs to vote, then Tony gets an outsized vote. I get two votes. That's right. <laughs> well, I mean, but Charlie got two votes, so, I mean. Right. <laughs> I, just, I don't <laughs> I mean, you just have to be comfortable in the way your dog's going to vote, right? Like, I think that's. I would cancel myself out. Discord there if the dog votes against you. Yeah. Actually, my dog is so trustworthy. I would totally trust her with the vote. Deborah's cats <laughs> cannot vote. No uh, cats. Claire Bell would, would probably tell me, that, oh, I'm going to vote this way, I'm going to vote this way, and then like waylay me to sideswipe me at the very end. I'll be like, <laughs> Claire Bell, bad dog, bad yeah. dog. Totally. And they listen in on all your conversations so they know your argument and they probably already come up with a good defense of it. We're way back at it. <coughs> right, right. All right. We just vote for food. Dog? What's that? Did my cat would just vote for food. That's it. Most of the time I do too. I, I only got on council because we got free dinners before a uh, council meeting. So yeah. even... that got screwed up. <laughs> didn't, we get a, didn't we get a per diem out of this deal at least? Yeah, we or... Deborah, we could get a coupon to Crave Car or something, and they could deliver dinner at the same time everywhere. No. Yes, home delivery. Yes, and we got a pay cut in the process. No meals and a pay cut. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, let's get back to it. <sighs> Motion wow. to adjourn. Oh, man. <laughs> I'd second that. Second. We can. We, we, we got we to get through some stuff. Uh, <clears throat> is there stuff, though, that people want to take off of it? Is, is there? No. Okay. Uh, tourism board structure. We're just running a little bit behind Christian Henny, my timekeeper. Uh, tourism board structure, who's up on this? I kind of thought, Charlie, since you wrote the memo, you were kind of up on this. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, 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 was, I was happy to take lead. So um, if you read the memo, I really tried to figure out this structure. That, and this came because Lisa Lager and I had a earlier discussion and she, I don't know if she's down and she may want to weigh in on this as well, but um, the problem came in, and I think Paula, you mentioned this to me as a board, uh, council representative to the tourism board, and that is that there was going to be this huge impact because next year there's like five people that are going to come off and it's a, it's a tough board to, you know, to just walk in and start understanding it. So I started trying to think of how to restructure it. Um, is that evolved? I had conversations with um, some of the people in the lodging industry and more conversation with Lisa and the structure of the board probably needs to be looked at. Uh, I have an idea what it ought to be, but I think the tourism board ought to be looking at that. And I've, I shared my idea with, with Lisa. So I guess my deal for tonight would be we do two, two different motions. One is we point to people. I think Ryan uh, set us out a ballot to to, uh, to vote on the tourism board. It's in their emails. <clears throat> but uh, you, you, you have two lodging candidates. So you have Lindsey Ball and Taylor James. And I write down the first names down in my memo, but I think that's right. Lindsey's associated with the uh, Hot Springs Pool. Taylor's with the uh, the uh, Hotel Colorado. One would be appointed a, uh, to a regular membership. The other would be an alternate. And then in the the citizen with an interest in tourism, we have Patrick Drake, who's a current member, and then I forgot Ms. Montrose Cowan's first name, and I don't have it in my memo here, so I, I apologize. She would be uh, the other one. One of those two would be appointed with the other one being an alternate. Uh, and then it really gets tricky because you have this tourism, you have a resident 
who is not directly related, directly or indirectly related to tourism, lodging, restaurant, or retail. And um, the Sharon Brady has a, is an owner of a retail store downtown, so she technically doesn't doesn't qualify there, but she's got that position, and she she's got another year in her term. Um, and Susan Amory works for the caverns and the Iron Mountain Hot Springs. So the question is, does she have a direct or indirect interest? I don't really have any view on that because I, I, my view is that those resident positions that were appointed probably need to be looked at. There's probably not, uh, they're probably not good people, not the people themselves, but the, the concept of it, just a resident doesn't have any connection to those industries. Probably not a, uh, not a, a reasonable thing because this is such a technical field and and uh, the, the support of the the funding that we that is available and it is needed to be spent each year to support Glenwood should be done by people who are in the industry to understand it. Um, so I guess my view is is and then we have uh, Mike Meritorious uh, who is the chamber rep and I think that's all. I didn't write Mike's name now because he's he's the only appointment for that, but he would be appointed to that position. So. My view is we, we point those people. If you're going to point Ms. Emery, I think, and I shortened the memo because it was confusing. Um, you want to replace um, Suzanne uh, Stewart uh, on that. I think that that would be a one year term, but. Um, I think we just had to put, my view is we had to put Ms. Emery as an alternate. We'd avoid that issue as you're a resident or non-resident. And the next year, if the, if the tourism board comes up with a new structure, uh, then we can, we can get, we can finish correcting these, these terms. The three people for the, the uh, that are, that'll leave one vacancy. But if the three people, the, the two people we appoint should be for a three-year term uh, to 2024, that'll allow for that basically a 333 structure. And I probably confused everybody again, so I apologize. Yeah, let, let, can I ask a question, Charlie? <clears throat> um, so I was talking to Lisa earlier today and it, she felt that, that this might not be a big deal because if we name an alternate tonight, then, and we promote that alternate next year, it's not five people turning over, it's four. And if <clears throat> one of the two people that are term limited, say Trent Blizzard, decides to, to go back on after a year off, then we only have three vacancies. Three vacancies on a nine-person board is—I don't—I don't see that as a huge cliff effect or a huge problem that we need to solve. Part of the problem, I think, just for everybody, is because we adopted a two terms and you're done, you know, deal a couple meetings ago. So I think that's what's causing some of this. But at least from my count, that worst-case scenario, four people will need to be replaced on a nine-person board, but possibly three. So. I'm not sure we need to address the structure about adjusting people's terms or extending people's terms. I'm, I'm fine. I, I don't, I'm not, this ain't a South Bridge thing and I'm real concerned about it. I just don't see it as, as a huge issue. Um, I do support, I think we'll get to it. It's actually the next agenda about the actual appointments, but all that you said about who to appoint, um, you might need to, well, other people are gonna have questions about it. Maybe I'll catch up with those questions. So Paula. Um, so I just wanted a little clarity. Um, number one, one of the things that um, when I was kind of looking at this on the agenda, I was thinking of some things that I've had some conversations about, and one of them was alternates. We've never had alternates on the tourism board, so I would like to make that um, a discussion with the council of saying, yes, let's get an alternate on every board and commission so that we have that opportunity for transition um, in the future and we know that somebody can step into a position um, with a full on regular term and so we don't have that possibility of everybody falling off which is some of how this conversation came up when i was in the tourism board meeting um you know there was a request that one of the people who would be falling off next year get an extension by one year but i think you're looking at what charlie's saying here about replacing um drawing a blank. I should have this in front of me. Um, Suzanne, who's dropping off um, because, because she's resigned. Um, you know, if we replace her for the term, 
but instead give her a, you know, a, a different term ending that would take care of that problem as well. I do want to say Patrick Drake is on that board right now representing um, the tourism trade rafting. Um, so I would hate to move him out of that representation. And the other thing that I am concerned about, and this is actually in opposition to what you said, Charlie, is I do think a citizen um, makes a difference on that board um, as opposed to everybody being involved in the tourism trade because they are giving a perspective of, you know, I yeah, live in the community. We heavily invest in tourism. I wanna know how it goes and I wanna know, you know, I wanna have my say as that citizen comment on those things. And in most cases that board works really well together. Um, and I just think it would be that one other kind of voice on that um, um, board to have, you know, just some outside perspective. And the other thing that worries me about that board is everything is downtown. Um, it, it's, it's focused to the downtown. And I do worry about our uh, hotels out on 6 and 24. Um, you know, when we look at the meadows, those people rely on tourism traffic. So um, we really need to kind of look at this is more than the downtown core when we talk about tourism in Glenwood Springs. Uh, Charlie, do you want to respond real quick to that or do you have other comments? Otherwise, I'm going to go to Ingrid. Uh, no, if I just real quickly, I, Paul, I, I'm not saying, I'm just saying, I, I think there's an issue of the resident. I, I don't care what the board is making. My concern is that we're pointing people every, so we have three people every, every three years and we meet the criteria. And Patrick is not a, he's not the tourism representative. That's uh, uh, Nancy and uh, Mr. Goss. They're the tourism. And then the, the lodging, uh, one of those is falling off. And, and um, that's the one that we're, we're going to report to, to, to 2024. Patrick is the resident who is associated directly or indirectly with one of the three, A, B, or C. That's the way I understand the current makeup of the board. And I have no yeah. problem with reappointing. Yeah, it is, it is kind of confusing. I just know in the tourism board meetings we were talking about, I can't remember, is it her name, Heather? It was like, oh, well, Patrick represents rafting, and so does, I, I think it's Heather. Sorry, I don't have this. It's in the next section, <laughs> but uh, yeah. so that that kind of came up in a discussion, but that's fine. Yeah, I don't care the make of the board. I just, to me, I would like to point two of these people to tw 24 terms, and if we're going to point somebody else other than an alternate, which I think is a better way to do it, uh, then you guys can figure it out on the board and come back and make recommendations. So by next year, we make appointments. We now have people every three years. Ingrid. So, uh, Paula, you asked good questions, and they were questions that I, too, asked Lisa when I had coffee with her oh, last week, maybe, week before. Um, she indicated that when, in past, they had people who were less associated with um, the tourist industry. She actually said she had someone who worked at Valley View and who was in the construction industry, two different people. She said they had a hard time engaging. Their, their schedules didn't always allow for them to meet at the times that they meet for the, the meeting. And she said she felt that they didn't always even have a, a lot of interest in being on them. I mean, they wanted to be on the board, but they didn't have the same jargon and, and just basic um, interest level in, in, the, in that industry. So that was why she herself encouraged us to go this route. She felt like it was a good route. Um, in addition, I actually I'm curious if we should make a motion to just a broad range, add an alternate on these boards, or as we're doing this this evening, do we need to make a motion on each one to add a permanent alternate to the board? I don't know which is a better route to do it. Carl, can you opine on that? Uh, currently, your code doesn't actually provide for alternates. So if we don't have a code, that no, the how do we have alternate? There's a provision. In, there's a provision in the code, Carl, that says that um, you could we could appoint three alternates in any board commission. I don't know which section it is. Right. I I just looked yeah. that so, up. I mean, today. I guess one of those things like I, you know, let me back up. I, I 
I don't know actually across all the boards and commissions how many you have appointed now as alternates because it seems like we're doing it pretty regularly. <laughs> Setting that aside for a moment, I mean, honestly, you can kind of do what you would like to with this. Um, I do think that the more important thing is if you're going to change the makeup of the board, you know, how you appoint or who you appoint tonight may not be that, uh, you know, I mean, I, I don't want to say it doesn't matter, but it's, it's potential that it's, that's all going to change if you guys revamp the board makeup, whether it's to a total number or categories or however you want to do it. Um, so from that standpoint, it's you guys' call what you want to do. Um, because you can always change these boards serve at your at your pleasure so if you want to change things up you can um so i don't know that that's super helpful jonathan but that's the reality is, is that if we're looking at a change coming up who you appoint tonight and for what terms may not be relevant well having just met with lisa and also reviewed charlie's kind of structure I am I'm in agreement with what Charlie wrote up. I think it was it aligns both with what Lisa and the feedback we received from her as well as what I think would be a good moving forward. So, so Mr. Mayor, I just looked at the belt. I just looked at the ballot that Ryan put together and it doesn't doesn't one I don't necessarily agree that Susan Embry would be the resident seat to fill Susan's vacancy. Um, because I think, well, we we don't have to determine tonight whether whether she's directly or indirectly related. We just appoint her as an alternate. Would be my view, and we appoint Mike as a chamber member, one of the two lodging people, and one of the two resident business seats, such as either Patrick or Heather, uh, to a three-year term. And the other ones are all the other three that applied are all be appointed as alternates, and then we can sort it out next year. That's my recommendation. So Charlie, if I may, maybe the easiest thing to do is that um, for those that there's only one candidate, if you would be willing to make a motion as to how you want those seated, and we can clear those even they're on, though they're on the ballot, um, and then it's just those contested seats, which I think would be what you're suggesting is that the one with the most votes is the permanent member and the other one is the alternate, right? Sure, that, that works. So, do you want to make a motion? I'm just trying to keep things moving along at 9:22. Paula may have a comment. I see she's got her hand up. So, you guys are making this much more complex than it has to be. It's a, it's just very simple. Can we just move along, please? Because I'm leaving at 10, whether you're done or not. Paul, go ahead. Hey, just a one other thing. And again, I'm looking at this as not what our vote is on the next agenda item, which is figuring out the tourist, tourism council representatives is um, not only do I think we need alternates. The other thing that I think we need to do is change some of the wording on these. So I'm, I'm disappointed um, with um, not being able to talk to Mike Mercatoris or having many responses on his um, his application other than yes, which is great. And it's great if you're familiar with them, but if we're really saying, hey, we have to interview these people and talk to them to see if we want them, then we need some kind of um, mechanism that we're saying, look, you got to talk to us. Um, you don't get to do it just because somebody from chamber wanted you to be there. And it's not a comment on Mike. It's just we really, if, if, if we're going to do these interview processes and we're going to look at these people, then it, give them questions that aren't yes or no or say you you have to come to an interview one or the other and and that's not for tonight tonight we move forward but in the as we go in the future maybe we can look at that um and and get a better idea of who we're bringing on these boards i've noticed in all of the other um applications um for all the different boards that you know it would be shelly interviewed the people that were up for the arts and culture and you know, um, Jonathan talked to the people on the, somebody talked to them, you know, but this one was a, the tourism board. What is it again? The tourism board, F, no, DDA and something else. We all are supposed to talk to it. And if we don't get a chance to talk to them, you know, we're just, you know, anybody can walk, walk in off the street from what I can tell and, and take a board seat. And I'm not sure that's what we want if they're our advisors. So I just want to throw that out there. I was a little disappointed in that particular 
applicant. So I'm going to make a, I agree with Tony, we can, we can drag this on. I'm going to make a, a, a more specific motion that Carl suggested. I'm going to move that we appoint Patrick Drake as the resident business seat with a term ending February 24, Lindsey Ball as a lodging seat with a term ending February 2024, Mike Meritorius uh, as a chamber seat ending in February 2024, and Susan Emery, Taylor James, and Heather Montrose Cowan as three alternates to the tourism board. I'll second the motion. Uh, <clears throat> further questions? You know, I I, uh, I would like to see Taylor James in that uh, lodging seat myself and Lindsey Ball as the alternate, my preference. So I, I don't know how that affects it, but go ahead, Ingrid. I'm, I'm with Jonathan as well. Just that would, what you just said is exactly how I would, I would like it. I'll modify and I'll remove the, the appointment to the lodging. Let's do that one separately. Thank you. That, that's a clean way to do it. Uh, any other comments on any of the other uh, votes? Uh, Paula? I modify my second. Okay. Thank you. And then Thanks, Shelly. <laughs> I think, Paul, you had a good point. Uh, Charlie, would you consider also taking out the uh, microtosis for the chamber seat as well so we can vote on that separately? <laughs> well, I guess we can do it in an individual motion in each one. So I, all right, I'll, I'll, let's just start over. Is that okay, Shelly? I don't know. There's a lot of names on there. So if you're, if you want to take the chamber seat and consider that separately, I would just do that. I'd recommend that. And let's get the rest of it done. <laughs> And, and you guys, did everybody see the ballot that Ryan sent? Did, we don't want to use that. I guess not. It, the problem is, is, I don't agree with the way he's got uh, Ms. Emery listed. I, don't, I think she's uh, directly or indirectly related to one of the industries. So that's my problem. Well, then let's not vote on that, but vote on all the other ones. Yeah. Well, that's what I was trying to do, but I don't care. Okay, so the motion, Charlie, can you clarify the motion as it stands? Well, if we take out the lodging and we take out Mike, then we're voting on Patrick Drake for the resident business seat in for term in February 2024. <laughs> All in favor of Patrick Drake for the resident business seat term in 2024. So saying aye and raising your hand. Aye. Cool. Next. Uh, I, will, I will not make a motion to appoint Mike Meritorious as the chamber seat for term ending in 2024. Great, is there a second? Tony seconded by raising his hand. All those in favor of uh, pointing Mike to the chamber seat signify by saying aye or raising your hand. Aye. All those opposed? Motion carries four three. Is that correct? Is that a split vote? I just wanna make sure that, that everybody agrees to that. Okay, everybody's not and they agree to that. All right, next one, uh, Suzanne Emery for the residence seat. <clears throat> um, I'd like to leave her as an alternate. Let's just vote on the uh, lodging one and then the rest we can make alternates. That's my view. Oh, I'm sorry, okay. Uh, lodging, uh, this is somebody, uh, Taylor James for lodging. All those and in favor? Oh yeah, sorry. The second that, Ingrid? Okay, uh, all those in favor of uh, Taylor for lodging signify by saying aye or raising your hand. All those opposed? Any opposed? Okay, motion carries unanimously. Now, Charlie, are we to- I would vote that we have appointed Heather Montrose Craven, uh, Lindsey Ball, and Susan Emery as alternates to the tourism board with an undefined term at this point. And I'll second Charlie's motion. I don't, I'm not gonna support a, a board that has nine members and three alternates. I think three alternates are, it, that's just, that's just, I don't know, that seems pretty unwieldy, but let's take the vote. It's been moved by Charlie, second by Ingrid. Uh, 
All in favor, signify by saying aye or raising your hand. Anybody disagree? All those who disagree. Uh, Tony, what was that? What was your vote? I voted aye. Okay. So the that's is three. It passes four or three. Okay, thank you, Carl, for helping me out with that. <laughs> All right. Any other motions on the tourism board that we need to determine? I would just give the, the tourism board direction. I don't know if we need a motion to look at the structure and the report back to us before the end of the year on that structure. So when we make appointments in 2022, we've got this solved. Is that, I can make it a motion, but in my view, if we give just give, if everybody agrees where they should do that, then my view is that's the easy way to handle it. Is there a second? Okay, motion fails for lack of second. Uh, well, I would like to just make a comment on that, Charlie. And I guess, um, you know, that structure was set up by council in I think 2009 or so. And I guess I'd rather have, I'd like to have council have, have input on that structure. I, no problem that uh, somebody's got to start it. And I think lodging is the best place to start it. And I'll tell you, I spoke to Bruce Christensen who had a lot of uh, voice in that uh, two or three days ago. And he, he agrees, he thinks there's a need to take a look at it because he thinks the, the reasoning when they did it originally doesn't exist anymore. And I won't get into more detail tonight, but, mm -hmm. but somebody's got to make a recommendation that Terzo can make the recommendation. We still got to talk, we have to approve the change in structure. Yeah. So I don't want to spend a lot of yeah, time. So that was what I was recommending. I wasn't saying they, they decide. They make a recommendation by the end of the year. We, we have to decide the terms because we have three people now appointed for indefinite terms. So at some point we have to decide that, correct? Right. Okay. Yeah, and I, I would argue that underneath the code, if you leave them undefined, they end in three years because that's what the code says the term of an appointment is. Yeah. Paula. Charlie, does um, it, is it allowable, and maybe this is a Carl question, for the tourism board to look at this upon themselves without being directed by council, or is that, it does it need that direction of council? They could certainly make a recommendation that they'd like to change the structure of their board and bring it back to council. I don't know that you need to direct them to do that. I mean, okay. they might not to do that, but I think they probably will bring it back. Okay. <clears throat> okay, do we need further action on this? No. Further direction? Okay. Uh, next item. Airport Commission appointments. Uh, let's see. I had interviewed <clears throat> all the applicants, uh, Stephanie Stanfield and Sean Thomas, uh, fit their criteria um, and they were uh, recommended also by the other members of the airport commission. So I would support them. Joe Mueller lives outside of city limits and uh, thus is not eligible. The airport board is as all, most of our boards allowed to have one person uh, serve on their board who lives outside, but has, uh, I believe, business interests or owns real property or business in, in town. And that uh, position is already filled by Richard Bach. So I don't believe, unless we want to uh, make a change or clarify that alternates can, we can have a number of people on the board not be citizens. That feels like a longer conversation if that's what the direction we want to go. So I wouldn't recommend him now for a alternate position. And we don't have an alternate position that's actually unfilled on that board yet. So I do think it, it would be good to have an alternate position, um, but I don't know that we have board um, uh, council consensus on whether we want to have more than one person outside city limits serve on these boards. So, uh, my recommendation is we appoint Sean and Stephanie 
and at a future conversation, uh, if there is a will for folks to have that conversation, we need to bring that up, I think, at a, a short council meeting item and agenda item. And Jonathan, as I understand it, you're, you're suggesting Stephanie for term ending in 23 and Sean for 24, correct? That's what the memo said. Yes, I am. <laughs> <laughs> What the memo said. That's a motion. I'll second it. Okay. Uh, it's been motioned by myself, sorry, but seconded by Charlie. Any further conversation? Okay. All those in favor, say by, by saying aye. Aye. Uh, aye. Any opposed? All right. Unanimous. We did something easy tonight. All right. Uh, River Commissions. Uh, Charlie, is that yours? Yep. I think that's me. And we have two members who have just commit, uh, completed their first term. And that's Scott Schreiber and Erica Gibson. They have both applied to re-up for another three years. And I recommend both of them being reappointed. They've been really active on the board and um, they've been great members, a lot of expertise there. So definitely recommend both of them. And now we have a new member Richard Chip Fisher, who's also a water engineer, great experience again, and I had the opportunity to interview him. And I would also recommend that he be appointed to the board. I'll second that. Uh, further discussion or questions? All those in favor, signify by saying aye and raising your hand. Okay. Uh, any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. All right, uh, are we to arts and culture? Parks and Rec, excuse me, Parks and Rec. Councilor Davis. Uh, that's me, so I'd like to discuss completely restructuring the... <laughs> no, I, you know, I looked at the, um, the issues, it says none, and that's kind of where we're at. I. Um, I did not interview Jasmine because I know her and she sat on that board and she's up uh, for an, uh, just a renewal. Uh, I did interview Chris who lives up at Sunlight and I uh, thought he'd be a great addition to the board. So, and Steve is, so does Chris, uh, is he the only one, just previous conversation, is he the only one who would be on the Parks and Rec Commission that would be outside city limits? Yes. Is because Don uh, Randolph, uh, who was outside of the city, did not re up. Okay. Uh, Steve, you have a, is that a motion? Yeah, that's a motion. Okay. Yeah, I would, uh, my motion would be to accept these as written. A second. Moved by Steve, seconded by Shelley. Any further conversation? All those in favor, signify by saying aye and raising your hand. Uh, any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Arts and Culture Board appointment. That's me again. Very excited to get two new members on the Arts and Culture Board. I interviewed Jenny Trumbull and John Carr, and um, I would recommend that they both be be appointed to the Arts and Culture Board, Jenny for a term that ends in 2024, and John for a term that ends in 2023. Second. Uh, moved by Shelly, seconded by Charlie. All those in favor signify by saying aye, or raising your hand, aye. Any opposed? I thought Paula was not, um, in favor of this because she didn't signify anything, but I think her video froze. So uh, I, she probably can hear us, but I'm going to say just for legality sake, motion passes 6-0 with uh, Councillor Stepp um, not able to vote on that motion. Um, I do need to, I became aware that um, my motion for the airport commission, there's only one vacancy actually. Um, not two, as I had implied. I, I uh, had thought that we had two seats, but I think I counted the alternative seat that I wanted to add. So can we revisit that really quick? Um, 
I guess I would just add, ask council simply to uh, continue to affirm Stephanie Stanfield as the. Oh, am I freezing now? Hold on, I'm gonna I'm gonna mute some people here. I'm getting some feedback. Or if you could mute your guys yourself, I'm sorry, I'm just getting a little feedback. Uh, I would I would uh, move to affirm Stephanie Stanfield as the regular uh, commission member, and then I would like uh, to um, have Sean Thomas be the alternate, assuming everybody's okay with adding an alternate position to that board. So if that's okay with everybody to add an alternate position and fill that with Sean Thomas, uh, signify by say, oh, I'm sorry, that's my motion. Is there a second? Second that. Seconded by Tony. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion. Yeah, the, the formal, to be, to be a part of to carry for a few moments, that's to reconsider your prior motion and substitute this motion, correct? Thank you. And you should note that Paula was not on that on that vote. That, yeah. That's a zero vote with, with, yeah, uh, with Paula. Yes. Nobody cares about Paula. <laughs> She needs to get better internet. Uh, Matt Langhorse is working on it. I have been told Matt Langhorse is getting everybody better internet. Uh, okay, item number 20, resolution number five, of resolution city of Glenwood Springs, adopting and updating to the downtown plan of development of the Glenwood Springs Downtown Development Authority. Mr. Mayor, could we promote Laura Kirk? Yes. We also promote Christian. He is the chair of that board. Yes. Laura, are you able to turn on your camera? Um, I'm not sure it's going to let me do that. Can you hear me? Yes. Normally, my camera would just come on. Well, go ahead. All right. Sorry. I know. It's very late. Um, I, I did have a presentation, but I think given uh, the late hour, I'm just going to give a brief introduction. Um, you do have a resolution before you tonight approving an update to um, the downtown plan of development for the Glenwood Springs uh, Development Authority. The um, original plan of development was created and approved in 2001. That um, is a statutory requirement. Um, the 2001 plan of development presented goals and objectives for the DDA um, and outlined some specific examples of projects for consideration. Um, the 2001 document is 20 years old and so outdated and uh, that is why we went through the process of updating that plan um, to reflect advances and changes in the downtown over the last 20 years to align the plan with other um, city documents, to uh, refresh the mission statement um, and outline um, new desired outcomes and to create a strong uh, policy foundation for future work. Uh, I would say that um, in uh, 2020, this, this past year, um, the DDA has had I think a very good uh, collaborative effort with both the city and the chamber. Um, we've built great working relationships and had, had a number of um, very positive outcomes, I think during a very difficult time for the downtown area. And we think that the plan update um, sets us in motion uh, to continue that collaborative partnership with both the city and the chamber as we look at um, opportunities that are going to present themselves 
2021 and beyond. Um, as part of the plan update, there is um, no change to the TIF and the underlying uh, financing structure of um, the DDA. So this is really uh, specifically, um, you know, uh, an outline of uh, mission, vision, um, objectives, and um, goals and, and potential projects. Um, and with that, um, I'm certainly willing to go into more detail, but I'm going to turn it over to you, Mr. Mayor and the council for uh, questions or comments. Any questions? Tony, go ahead. So Mr. Mayor, this is sort of what we've discussed about, well, we've talked about this a lot, but basically, so people listening now, or if anyone's listening, we're refocusing the direction of the DDA from just development to sort of the post-pandemic financial recovery. Is that a fair statement or would you want to expand on that, Jonathan? You know, I'd love for Laura to expand on that. Or Laura, I'm sorry, or John, or Christian. Thank you. Whatever gets your vote, Tony. Sure. <laughs> um, I think it's uh, a part of that, um, Councilman Hershey, in that yes, um, our, uh, authority has been expanded, but I think also um, if you, uh, it was part of the packet, if you look at the original plan that there are just many parts of that original plan that are um, just no longer viable or no longer um, for consideration for the city. And so we also wanted to have a document that aligned with other policies and directions for the city so it provides a foundation and underpinning for uh, the DDA to work with the city the chamber, the council um, and the business community um, to move forward in a um, structured and um, deliberate way. Thank you, Laura. Any other questions? Charlie, go ahead. More comments, I guess. I have a question. I'd love a question. I'm, I was ready to make a motion. Uh, if I can, I'll make a motion. Do we need to open this for public comment? You probably can if you want to. Oh, okay. Does uh, anybody from the public want to comment on this item? I see Dave Merritt's hands up. It's been up a while, and I believe that was his hand was addressed by the uh, cleanup on the uh, airport appointment. So assuming Dave Mayor does not want to comment on the DDAs. Anybody else? Okay. Uh, go ahead, Charlie. I make a motion we approve resolution 2021 number five, a resolution of the city of Glenwood Springs, Colorado, adopted an update to the downtown plan of development of the Glenwood Springs Downtown Development Authority. Second. Motion by Charlie, seconded by Councillor Davis. Further conversation? All right, Ryan, let's take uh, the vote. <clears throat> Paula, Paula's got a comment. Oh, I'm sorry, Paula. Please, She's sorry. She's back. <laughs> <laughs> You're muted, Paula. All right, sorry. I'm glad I got back right in time. I just have one question in this update. Um, the uh, the somewhere through here. Let me see if I can find it real quick. The, it mentioned these are four year terms. Is is the DDA four years? The All members shall be appointed for staggered four year terms commencing July first, ending June thirtieth. Uh, the DDA um, board members are for four terms. We four years, we have um, one member who uh, is a three-year term, but all others are four-year terms. Okay, because I thought that our recent, um, the council recently said everybody's going to three-year. So just clarity on maybe Carl's part. Yeah, I was gonna say, I, I think really what it is, Paula, is that the DDA is a little bit different than everything else you deal with because it's actually a statutorily created entity. Okay. Um, so it, operates underneath its own set of bylaws. Um, even though the city does a point, it would require an amendment to their bylaws to change their terms. And I think that's 
we probably need to have the code reflect that um, better, but that's really why there's, okay. it's, it's just a different thing. All right, I just wanted to make sure because I was like, oh, that was different. See, I actually read it. No, yeah, I, I actually missed, missed the presentation. <laughs> we appreciate you reading it. All right, thank you. All right, any further questions or discussion? All right, uh, oh, Charlotte, go ahead. I'd like to ask one quick question. And thank you, I, you know, I have done a fairly, I will admit I've done a quick read of the, the plan and it looks great to me. I think it, it, it outlines the main projects that are coming up in the near future rather than being, you know, all encompassing visionary. And I like that about it because I think it's, it's workable and it's achievable. I have one question on, we've, we've seemed to have settled on this, this name of the 8th Street Crossing. Mm -hmm. And my remembrance of that is that that was kind of just a name that was thrown out there when we, when we considered that we needed to separate talking about the confluence from talking about the development area. And I just wondered if maybe the DDA would just consider coming up with a a more meaningful and uh, creative name for that area. So I'm just going to put that out there and just as, as plant that seed. Laura, I like Tony Hershey Memorial. No. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Can we include your dogs too, Tony? Sure. Or the Christian Henry open space. I don't know. <laughs> Thank I you. Great. And we would be glad to take that under consideration. And I think. Um, Councilman Davis would approve of that as well. Uh, great. We have a motion, a second. I have 6% battery and my charger's in my daughter's room who's asleep right now. So let's call the question. <laughs> All right, sounds good. Let's get this started with Councilor Stepp. Yes. Councilor Hershey. Yes. Councillor Davis. Yo. Councillor Wusso. Yes. Councillor Wilman. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Cow. Yes. Mayor Godis. Yes. It passes six one. All right. I think it was seven. Seven oh seven seven oh. Steve said yo. He didn't say no. Yeah, that was well, a yes. I almost got that right. I was so proud of myself. <laughs> He's throwing everything up to me. I, I'd hate it if I was registered as a no vote on my board. <laughs> <laughs> you had me worried for a minute, Steve, but I thought it was yo. So. Sorry. <laughs> it's like. Thank you very, very much, and uh, look forward Thank to Thank you, guys. Thank you, Christian. Good night. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council. All right, uh, Deborah, City Manager's Report. Deborah, could you address that press release real quick that just came out? Yes, um, the community center will be closed for at least a day where we need to do um, one of the employees did test positive for COVID and we're going to have to do contact tracing working with Garfield County Public Health. So we will do that. Keep you guys updated. Hope the employee is doing well, so. Yeah, those, uh, they come as a surprise now because it's, you know, a lot of people gotten vaccinated or have antibodies from having had it. So it, it fortunately, it, it's a big deal when it does happen. Um, see the attorney. Nope. Nothing go. What's that? Said nothing this evening. Okay. All right, we met uh, Tony's deadline. Uh, can I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Moved by Charlie, seconded by Shelley. All in favor, say aye. 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 Motion carries unanimously. Good night, folks. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody.